Hey, loyal listeners, you have clicked play on the spinoff show here on the Jock and Nerd podcast. My name's Anthony. You know who I am. I'm the Jock. And on this episode, I could not be more excited to have this guy on. I have on Sean Chandler, one of my favorite YouTube reviewers from Sean Chandler Talks About. He's on my show. Holy crap. I Instagrammed this guy, randomly slid into his DMs, and he responded. Super cool dude. Decided to come on my show. Super humble, super enthusiastic about movies. We talked about his path from being just a regular guy and developing into the YouTube Rotten Tomato certified movie reviewing sensation that he is. And we get to talk and nerd out about the MCU. What more could you want from this podcast? Now you're going to check it out. This is the great and powerful YouTubing sensation, Sean Chandler. This is the Jock Spinoff Show. Sean Chandler. First off... Hey, I am surprised that you responded to my Instagram immediately and said, <laughs> yes, I'll come on your podcast. Yeah, I, I kind of get that a lot. People are freaking like, wow, you actually responded to me. Like, yeah, it's, I tried to. I, I'll, I won't name names, but there are other YouTubers that have Instagrams that I really enjoy their YouTube videos for, and I will write them something and nothing. No response. Yeah, I... Um well, a big part of that is recently I felt like I can't respond to all the comments on my – I used to respond to every comment on my oh, videos. yeah. And then uh, both because there's just so many and then also just kind of for somewhat for mental health reasons that you, sometimes it just gets toxic in there and I can get swept up in that. Mm-hmm. And so then I, I'll respond for a window of time when I first post a video, but I don't want to be distant from the fan base. I, yeah. I want to interact with people. That's like the whole idea. And so whenever I went full-time on YouTube back in February, I started Instagram, and it kind of turned into a a neat little place where uh, I could still interact with people as much as possible. Uh, Mm -hmm. Up to this point in time, I feel like I'm not – it's not creating a problem for me. And also, if someone's a jerk, I just block them. So, like, this is getting (laughs) weird. Uh, And that's – I haven't done that. I've only done that a couple of times where people have been like, I don't – what are you doing? Like, this is – What are you talking about? Like, what are you doing? Like, what? I don't think, why do you feel like you can just say this to me and that I'm going to keep taking it? Like it's, <laughs> this is weird. Like, like you're just being defensive. Like, no, I, I, I don't have, I, you don't have the right to say this to me. Um, but so actually what I'll do is, uh, one of the great things about Instagram is you can just shoot little videos inside of the direct message thing. Oh, really? And so sometimes, yeah, oh, right that's inside right. of that's it, right. that's it's right. just a little camera right there, and you can do 15-second videos. And so like a week ago, I had some kind of a big announcement stuff. I got accepted on Rotten Tomatoes, and so I announced that on my channel. And so like 50 people all kind of congratulated me, or I don't know, I mean, a ton. And mm-hmm. so while my video for that day was rendering, I just sat down and shot a little personal video to everybody that sent me a message while it was rendering. And people were like, this is amazing. No one's ever done this before. I was like, yeah, I I was delivering paint back in January. Like <laughs> I was just driving around like any normal person. I'm I'm sending message to YouTubers like, hey, and then they didn't respond back to me. And so I, that was six months ago that I was just totally normal paint delivery guy. Right, right. And right. so that's where my mind is at. Of like, I know how cool it was for me. Whenever I would, they would just like my comment or anything like that. Right, right. And so that's where my mind's always at. Of like, that's a. You know, if I can still be accessible, I want to do that for as long as I can. Yeah. And then um, also just uh, doing podcasts, back to what you said about, wow, you actually said yes to me. I um, These are kind of fun. We're actually just going to talk to someone one-on-one and, you know. Absolutely. But whatever it is, whether that's uh, if you want to talk about me and, you know, feed my ego and my narcissism, let's do that. Or if you just want to talk about movies, hey, that, I, that's why I started my whole channel. So well, we can do a little of both. Uh, works for sound? me. <laughs> um, for those that don't know who you are, because we're, we're going to get to the you, you just humbly <laughs> dropped the Rotten Tomatoes thing. So we'll get to that. We'll <laughs> get to right, the full time YouTube. We have the intro yet and I've already yeah, yeah, taken yeah. over. But, but so I came across your stuff because I love watching YouTube essays, videos, all that stuff on movies. I'm a huge Marvel guy. Okay. I, obviously, we have a podcast about movies and comic book uh, culture and all that. And 
I watch a lot of like Chris Stuckman. I watch yep. a lot of um, a lot of those guys that are on uh, Collider. They have their own little channels, and I came across yours. And I was like, oh, you're another collider. Like, your, your video is kind of set up similar to those collider guys, right? You know, like, one camera, cool, like, like nerdy movie background, right. single camera shot. Um, and I was like, oh, this is another one of those guys. And then I, like, slowly started to realize, oh, wait, he's not affiliated with those guys. He's just a guy that starts talking about movies and then just started of kind of blowing up a little bit. I mean, you're at over 130,000 subscribers on YouTube. Looks like over 22 million views. Um who are you? What the hell? Who, for people that don't know who you are, who are you? What's going on? Tell us a little about yourself. Yeah. Um, so I'm just uh, – I was the guy watching all those channels you just described. Yeah. Uh, th- that's what I've been watching since about 2011. I discovered John Campia via yeah. Collider.com, the blog, and he had a, his – prototype before movie talk um, was something called for your consideration. And I discovered that because it was on collider.com, the the blog, and he was partnering with frosty, the editor over there. And they actually linked over to rotten tomatoes. And so on rotten tomatoes, I found collider. And so it's like that, this whole lineup of things. And I just started watching them. And in my previous life, I was a previous, uh, you know, as in three years ago, I worked at a church. And so I would, to, with teenagers. And so I could hold the attention of teenagers talking to them. So I was like, all right, you know, if I can hold the attention of a really immature, dumb 13 year old for 30 minutes, I could talk about a movie for five minutes and mm-hmm. people would pay attention to me. So I was going to kind of watch what they were doing. I was like, I think I could do that. And so back like five, six years ago, kind of put up these demo videos real quick and, you know, posted one video, took six months off, posted another video, so, Six months off. Didn't really go anywhere, but uh, just kind of had fun kind of doing it whenever I would do it. But I just didn't have the time to, to lock into it. But I was watching Chris Stuckman, Jeremy Johns, Collider, mm-hmm. all of that stuff. Yep, yep. And then three years ago, uh, resigned from Church World. I had personal issues with addiction type stuff, and I needed to get healthy myself. And uh, Church World is very stressful, so didn't shouldn't be doing that. So I, I left that mm-hmm. and was four months without a job. Uh, cause I had a great resume for church world, but it was, shouldn't be in church world with a lot of the stuff. And I, you know, I just needed a reset. Okay. And so during this two months without a job, I was like, went to go see, you watched a lot of movies, watched a lot of movies. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Uh, went to go see ghostbusters 2016. Um, okay. Or, or as I call it, probably the, the greatest movie of all time. My wife and I go <laughs> to see this uh, for date night randomly Okay. and watched it. And I didn't even have a strong opinion about it. But I just went, hey, everyone's been talking about this on the, the internet. The internet had a strong opinion. The internet had a very strong opinion. Yeah. So I was like, I'm going to go and share my not very interesting opinion about this movie that's right in the middle. The least interesting take you can have on it is what I have. Let me go share that with the internet. And it, it just kind of stuck. Um, and I kind of, you know, it took me nine months to get my first thousand subscribers. Mm-hmm. And uh, 18 months before I really got any traction. And then Thor Ragnarok came out. And I changed up my format a little bit. I rank. I'm not as known for movie reviews as I am, kind of doing ranking videos where yeah, take a franchise, put yeah. them in order. And um, whenever Thor Ragnarok came out, I was like, "What if?" I, I had been doing these like 40 minute long rankings, and I was like, "I would never actually watch one of my videos. Mm. Like, I just hit record and I can talk for a long time." Right. But uh, I'd never watch this. So when that one came out, I went. What if I ranked all the Marvel movies in under 10 minutes? I would watch that. That's what I right. read on all these blogs. So that's a content I would consume myself. Up to this point in time, the video that I put out with the most views had like 22,000 views. I put out this Thor Ragnarok one. Is this on or, all on Sean Chandler Talks About All at this on time? Sean Chandler Talks About. Okay. Uh, and this is November or October, November of 2017. Yep. And this video goes on to get like 350,000 views. And wow, uh, just uh, just out of nowhere, out of nowhere. Wow. And but there, there's a little bit of, you know, I I'd kind of done enough of these rankings over the last six months. I was doing two per week. I was like, that's going to be my thing, I think. Mm-hmm. And then I finally put one out there that I'd kind of figured out how to do my my formula the best way that I could, at least where I was at at that point in time. And and then with the most popular franchise, so it was kind of all the pieces at the right time with how YouTube works. And it just kind of clicked. And at that time I was actually, uh, delivering paint. Uh, like I said, I was doing that up until delivering February of this paint. 
delivering pain. I went from church world <laughs> oh, and like le- like public speaking, counseling teenagers, uh, leading a team of twenty volunteers to picking up buckets of paint, carrying them around in uh, <laughs> the heat <laughs> summer of Texas in Texas. So where are you uh, based the- out of? Austin, Texas. Oh, fantastic city! I've been there three times. So I've been here since 19, uh, 1988. Okay. Um, other than college, this is where I've been. Nice. So, yeah, uh, I put out that video and it took off. And at the time, I had started interviewing with churches again to uh, – because delivering paint does not pay nearly as much as you would think delivering paint would really? pay. As it turns out – I've um, always had these misconceptions about how much thought, paint delivery yes, is. Six figures. No, no. <laughs> um, and so, I mean, I was really underemployed the whole time I was delivering paint – so I was looking to get back into church world and then this video happened and started to take off and kind of went to my wife and I was like, I don't want to go back to church world. Like I'm not, you know, we still go to the same church that I worked at. We're still mm-hmm. plugged in and everything. But um, as for working at a church, that's its own, that's its own crazy little world that I, I don't think I'm designed for. I don't okay. think that's kind of led to my, my issues, uh, personal struggles with alcohol. Okay. And so Basically, she's like, yeah, I don't want to go back to church. Well, that was a nightmare. Like, yeah, it was kind of a nightmare. Wait, that's kind of an interesting dichotomy. You would think like church would make you a better person. Uh, I, that, that, I've heard it described many ways of, you know, uh, I love eating hot dogs. I don't want to go to the, the hot dog factory. It's that, sure. so, okay. some, it's, some of it's that. But here's the best way to think about it is okay. that when you're – when you don't know anything about anybody, you, your your mind is intrigued. Oh, I wish I knew everything about everybody. Mm. And then when you're in church world, your job is to know everyone's business and everyone's issues. Oh, yeah. And so then you show up and you see everybody and you were just in a meeting two days ago and you found out that that marriage over there is falling apart. And that kid right there has been abused. Oh, and yeah. you're, you're on the front lines of all of life. That's And that's like you're the person that needs to be able to be strong for everyone else, and you got you got to carry all that those secrets in, in with you, and know yeah. that this is that person, and this is that person, mm-hmm. and I can't share this, and I have to be like, as you just mentioned, the, the face where I can't yep. let let my guard down. And, and I'll, I mean, I'll tell you the the heavy of it. So what happened with me is I, I lightly drank alcohol. And I had alcohol. My dad was an alcoholic, so I knew I probably should be careful with it, and it very much was for for eight years or something like that. Mm-hmm. And probably was dabbling a little bit too much as that was kind of you know, self-medicating for stuff, but it was very, in, you know, nothing that anyone normal would consider a problem. But mm-hmm. then in December of 2012, there was a huge suicide of a 16 year old girl at the local high school. Okay. And so then I'm called in as a frontline counselor at the local high school. Mm-hmm. And so like I'm sitting down in the library and they're like literally like walking in kid after kid after kid to process suicide. Like she, oh, I just geez. she was so pretty and she was so popular and we she was oh, we always thought she was wonderful and then now she's gone. What happened? Why did people commit suicide? I am not I'm not mm. the person that uh I don't have a anything that would qualify me to to be an expert in that. And so that's where where church world and then um Four months after that, one of my students from my church committed suicide. Oh, jeez. Like, I mean, and not like, not like a kid that like was in the back of the room, like, who's that kid? Who is, what? Like, like, this is, I know him. I knew his two brothers. I know both of his parents. He was in my small group. I, you know, I had known him for oh, my gosh. Uh, about five years and had seen him from sixth grade until 10th grade. Um, and then, you know, because I knew the family, uh, I was at his house with his parents the day after this happens. Jeez. Oh, and this is where, where kind of drinking came from. It was like, I, cause I don't know how you, that's the, I don't know how you're supposed to process that. You needed some sort of outlet. Something away. that I could yeah. just go home and like N- numb take, a little bit, numb it all away. The, yeah. All the reasons that, you know, uh, you know, if there's a good reason to drink and justify it, Hey, totally right there. And, right. but if you got alcoholic genes, if that's kind of your genetics is that you have an addictive personality. And I yeah, do, that's a tight rope. And then suddenly, you know, you have a couple of those in a little short period of time. Uh, I think that that same year, both of my grandparents on my dad's side died. And those weren't even sad deaths. They just happened to fall in this year where all, like so much death so much happened. Is going on. Yeah. And so that's where like church world, you would think, oh, yeah, wouldn't it make you a better person? If you're designed as a person that can turn off when you go home mm. after going to a high school and um, being a frontline counselor, and then you could just go home. Um, compartmentalization. Compartmental, like 
then I, that's what you need to be able to do or just have right. a really deep emotional well or be like have a very strong extroverted personality that you can just go out there. I'm very introverted. People don't – people think the opposite because I'm a dynamic communicator. Mm -hmm. uh, and like right now I can talk and vary my vo inflection and everything. And I, at an event, I can be the guy on stage, but I get off the stage and you start talking to me one-on-one -on -one and I get very uncomfortable. And so you start talking about, you seem all right right now. We've never talked in our lives. Yeah. Because I don't, I don't have to look at you in the face. You're just right now. I'm looking at a microphone. That's true. Like it says blue Yeti right in front of me. It's I, as long as it says that I'm totally fine. <laughs> but if like we were in person and we were, you know, target and you walked up to me and, um, you're like, hey, can we talk? I'd be, yeah. be very uncomfortable. Gotcha. Uh, and we're talking. I'm talking about myself. So, you know, my, my something, it's, it's something, yeah, something very comfortable, easy. Yeah. Yes. So, um, but that that's kind of where that all that church world getting tricky uh, kind of happens. Of there, you, yeah. If you stop and think about the weight that yeah. pastors, church staff have to hold, you start going, oh, okay. Now, it, some of this makes more sense. Can, can, I mean, the the things that make the news are the guys that are you know driving around and uh, you know sports cars have a mansion and they're taking advantage of old people. And that that's what the news talks about when they talk about pastor church world. That's not 99% right. of the pastors out there. They're people that make about as much as a teacher in the community. Um, they work 80 hours a week and it's a job that requires you to be a public speaker, a leader, a counselor, a whole bunch of different <sighs> things that are very demanding. And people in, you know, uh, obviously I can I imagine, I can imagine being in the church world, just carrying that burden is similar to like being like, paramedic or like exactly or ER yeah. doctor or police officer like first on the front lines or you know like stuff mm -hmm. where you just have to like I, I had a friend that was a paramedic and he was like there's he's like suicide rates are, are very high yeah. amongst paramedics because the stuff you see is mm -hmm. just you can't some of it you know you take home with you and you sometimes you can't let it go right so I'd what? imagine it's the same thing like some of the other ones that uh like I you know you'd be in a meeting and you'd find out that uh or, or uh you know which guys in the church are having affairs. And, oh, wow. you know, some of them, you're my students. My, uh, the, it, some of my students, I know their dad is off cheating. And, um, you know, and the, even like specific details about like he's you know, constantly texting his mistress even while he's at church. And then I see that guy on Sunday. And, uh, uh, you know. And you got to shake own, his hand with a smile. Yeah, I, I'm not that guy at all. I'm not yeah. going to be friendly with the guy. And yeah. so you just have to like deal with things like that. So it's it's a very... A very stressful way to do life. And I'm an introvert. I'm not someone that like I, I can go deep with a handful of people. Mm -hmm. I can't go broad. I can't go wide with a lot of people. Um, and I don't turn it off when I go home. I keep playing it out in my head. And I think that's a good thing about me. But it means that, uh, you know, but you're not cut it, out for that world. I'm not cut out to be on staff in that world. Yeah, I, I can completely sympathize because I'm the same way I am. I can totally be a people person and talk to people and raise my inflection and be interested when I need to be interested. But at the end of the day, I like I have my core people, my close friends I go super deep with. And then everyone else is just pretty much not surface level, but it's not it's hard for me to flip that switch with right. just anybody. So I can definitely um, I, I feel your pain or not pain, but I feel how you are. But to tie back to what we were talking about with YouTube, yeah, um, YouTube. so I wanted to start doing movie talk stuff back five years ago, 2013. Yeah. And it, some of it even tied to church world was so stressful and like, wow, I, I mean, I wish I had some creative outlet because I'm just feeling like I'm drowning in this church world stuff. So then I'd throw some stuff over on YouTube a little bit and then I get too busy and I couldn't keep doing it. Mm. And so that's also was the other reason of I'd always wanted to do it. But church world is just so demanding that I just didn't have the time that when I was unemployed for four months, I had plenty of time to start it up. And so, uh, yeah, that's that's kind of what happened. Um, so that it, Thor, Thor Ragnarok is when you hit it big. Yeah. right. Well, Thor Ragnarok is when the snowball started rolling down the hill. OK, so, so uh, that was 18 months into my time on YouTube. I had about 3000 subscribers when that um, when Thor Ragnarok came out. Because, yeah, I don't think I discovered you until probably maybe this past summer or not. this past, Maybe this spring, somewhere around there, um, like a year on ago. YouTube. No, no. I'm or, saying like or, I don't think I discovered you until maybe. Yeah, maybe like last year. Last year is when I discovered you last so, summer. Um, so that was piece number one. And 3,000 when Thor Ragnarok came out. Then okay. when Black Panther came out in February, so four months later, yep. I was up to about 10,000 subscribers. So big, big jump. Four months, 
tripled the number of subscribers, which was like huge to me. Like, wow, this is amazing. When does YouTube start noticing you? Like, uh, what, at, at what subscriber level? Like, do they start interacting with you? Yeah, like do, they do don't. They, they never they do. Still don't. Really? Okay. <laughs> um, I I mean, is it like a little side note? Um, I mean, I earned my silver play button at a hundred thousand subscribers. That's when you get it. Mm-hmm. And they didn't even like. I didn't. No notification. Nothing about any of it. I had to sit email support. Like, hey, how does this work about the silver play button? They're like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Let, let's figure that out. I was like, wait, you like just forgot about me? Like <laughs> that was like three months ago. I've added fifteen thousand subscribers, and then when they sent me my silver play button, they sent me an empty box. They literally sent me an empty box instead of my silver play button. What the hell? Yeah, it's the weirdest thing, and I still don't have one. <laughs> so, so what, what what is a hundred thousand subscribers? What, what does a silver play button mean for the the layman out there? So it's a hundred thousand subscribers. It's a hundred thousand subscribers. It's an award. What's on oh, YouTube okay. when you hit a hundred thousand subscribers, you've earned the silver play button. Got it. Okay. But because it's so decentralized, this, I don't have a point of contact. I, I literally just emailed the generic support for YouTube and said, hey, I've got a YouTube channel. Here's the link to my channel. Hit, <laughs> got 150,000 subscribers. How do I get that silver play button we we're talking about? <laughs> and they're like, yeah, let's look into that. I'm like, what? But what? They, they don't. That's what's okay. crazy about the whole thing. Okay. But so Black Panther came out. Yep. And I kind of put out the same – I, I put out my ranking of all the MCU villains and then two days later, all the MCU heroes. And, and I also updated all the MCU films. Those three videos are three of my top five most viewed videos and they're put out all in one week. The villains wow. one has 950,000 views. The the heroes has like 700,000 views and then 500,000 or something like that for the, the movies ranked. Mm-hmm. And they came out all in the same week. It changed my life. <laughs> no clue. I mean, literally someone in the comments is like, hey, you should rank the, the MCU villains. I was like, that's a pretty cool idea. So I just put this video out there. Video changed my life. Uh, and I started like I had a day where I added a thousand subscribers. It took me nine months to get the first uh, thousand. And then mm-hmm. after Black Panther, there's a day where I added more than that. My goal for the end of 2018 was 40,000 subscribers. I was like, if I get 40,000, I could probably go full time. Mm-hmm. And I hit it by June 1st. So but, ch- and I set it ambitious. Life. I set like ambitiously. I may, if I work really hard, I can get to 40,000 by the end of the year. I hit 40,000 by June 1st. I was like, wow, this is crazy. And my, my wife had a baby last year too. Like found out oh, first week, wife was pregnant and had a baby in September. So last year just transformed my life and ways that I was not anticipating as <laughs> a surprise baby. I mean, everything about it was like, wow, I, this is a, a, incredible, but yeah. How, so it changes your life. Like, so now you're like, you're like, man, I can start doing this full time. What is that full time? How do like, how do you monetize this? How does this happen? Uh, what what so, goes on? So the basic way with YouTube is YouTube has an ad share program. So you click on a video on YouTube and ad plays. Sure. And there's like a 60, 40 split with YouTube. So, and gen- over the course of my channel, averaged out, I make about $2.50 for every thousand views oh, on average. Okay. It's, it's, you know, average out. So a million views equals uh, $2,500. You can do some math on that to figure out. Right. Uh, so that's generically, that's the basic way. But inside of that, um, then I've got like Patreon page. So like where people can like chat with me a little bit, uh, a little bit more and, you know, pay $2 a month and, you know, chat with me on this, some exclusive Q&A type stuff, Mm -hmm. Um, affiliate links, um, sponsorships. Those are, those are fun ones. Like those are getting real fun. (laughs) He said like the, the, uh, actually tomorrow's the biggest sponsorship I've ever had. Um, and it's, they're crazy the way they work. It's, it's amazing. So, Um, so this is something now where you're like. I'm doing this full time and I'm, I'm living, I'm, I'm doing all right. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it's a lot scarier than that, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, well, yeah. I bet it's scary, uh, but because it's one you of those know, things where you can, you can literally, you can do it full time. Yes. Um, wow. So basically what I did, my thought was, and how to get wife on board was uh, I didn't spend the money I made last year. I just tried to save it up in basically a work account. Okay. And then I told my wife, whenever I quit, you know, we're not spending the YouTube money anyway. Uh, I will pay us the same amount I'm making delivering paint okay. out of this account. Okay. And I've got X number of months saved up. So no matter what, if I go full time, we're covered for six months. Okay. 
And then it was like, yeah, but what about insurance? Oh, yeah, that's a good point. Okay, let's let's wait a few more months, save a little bit more money. So then I will pay for insurance out of this account. Plus, I will pay me what I was making at paint store. And so then that saved up for this month months to give it a try as a ramp up. If I make no money for, I think it was six months is what I was looking at. Six, if I make no money for six months, we can, we're still making the same amount I was making at paint store. Mm-hmm. And then also I went full time leading into the release of Endgame. Basically, that was like, all right, when Endgame comes out, that's, I want to, I want to take full advantage of that, put out every crazy good idea I have. I want to do everything I can to put out the best That's the time to strike the iron. That is the time to strike the iron. And then also, that's the kickoff of the summer movie season. So then it's going to be three months straight of franchise movies coming out. And I just want to strike, keep striking that iron. And I think I'm, I've been delivering pain out in the sun 40 hours a week. And then I come home and make YouTube videos. I'm pretty sure I can sprint, post a video every single day, my best content. I can go six months just sprinting as soon as I start to try and just keep striking that iron while it is red hot until August 1st. And then I can start taking naps again, which <laughs> I am. That's that's why I have time to, to do t- plenty of podcasts now, because we've got made it past the that initial sprint. Yeah. Um, and so uh, here I am. Well, but, well, lucky for you though, in the like the movie season, like I remember when the summer blockbuster season was, it was all the big blockbusters. Everyone, all the movies anyone would talk about, and then the rest of the year, other than like Christmas time, there were all the other movies. Like it wasn't, but now, like Marvel kind of started that trend, and that, and it's like a lot of other big studios are following where they're releasing big movies in the fall, the winter, mm-hmm. February, April. So like you can be busy with big franchises the entire year. Yep. Which is awesome for you, right? Yes. yes. <laughs> well, I guess, well, I guess I'll find out. the The first five months have gone very well. So, so um, far, so good. So far, it, it it all has gone according to plan. Now, the tricky part is the last big movie of the summer, Hobbs and Shaw, come came mm-hmm. out today. Yes. So that means you released something today, which is today is August second for those that are. Don't know what, what time, when we're recording. Yes, and I released my Hobbs and Shaw review, Movie review. and tomorrow yeah. my uh, Fast and Furious ranking is my last big franchise ranking of the season. So uh, I got my whole plan to keep the momentum going, but my whole my plan was basically make a make a whole bunch of extra money in May, June, July, mm-hmm. so that that can float me through August, September when it's it gets a little bit barren. Mm. So you're putting out these reviews. Every it looks like for now every day almost. How long does it take you to record? Um, I, I mean it really depends on the video. Yeah. Uh, movie review is normally about twenty five minutes, and then cut down to about seven minutes. And you're so editing this yourself? I, I do everything myself. Okay. Uh, there's no one. I the it's a team of one. So anything you see posted on social media, anything that's shot, anything that's edited, it's all me. You know, you do a really good job and not to criticize other YouTubers, but they'll do a lot of cuts because obviously you know, they're saying, um, or they're, they, they want to clean it up a little bit. You do a very good one take of your review where you're not even using uh filler. Oh, words they're they're jam packed with cuts. I just put B roll on top of it. So, ah, so it's, clever. it's, it's, that's my editing. That's a slicker is what you're seeing. Yeah. There you go. Cause I was like, man, this guy never uses filler words. This guy's awesome. He, and he maintains that enthusiasm throughout the entire thing. Looks at the camera the entire time. Wow. Yeah. And so that's, that's, <laughs> um, I, you know, I figured out how to space it out just right to, to make all that, that how to, how much can I say in a certain amount of time in, in certain videos I know will have a hundred, 200,000 views. And so then mm-hmm. those ones will be written more detailed. Oh, okay. So you'll pre-write what you're going to like Some say. Some of them are that and other okay. ones aren't other ones. I kind of intentionally don't. Mm-hmm. Um, and I just say, I want to get, I'm going to talk for a minute and that's what I'm going to do. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of how I, I do it. But it's, there's not any single way. And there's like these Marvel rankings that I do. Those mm-hmm. will take two hours to film. And that's the part where it starts getting impressive where I like still energetic when I'm getting and coming in at number one. That's right. what it's like. If oh, it's my a, God. That's the voice. That's the, the, that's yeah. the voice you use. <laughs> <laughs> but so if it's a ranking that's, you know, a 20 long, I've been sitting in that chair talking for two hours trying to get all that right. Jeez. And so there's just on. And sometimes uh, you'll see my nose turn 
more and more red as I talk because that's one of my nose just turns red. It gets itchy as I talk, so I have to itch it between takes and everything. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so it just kind of keeps going. Um, so yeah, that's there's all kinds of backstory to all of it. But what I there were so many people that were doing the jump cut thing. Yep. And I did that. If you go watch my stuff from two years ago, you'll find the jump cut stuff. Yeah. And I went, okay, I don't, I don't want to do that, but I want it to move quickly and I want it to be dynamic. I want it to have a certain flow. I want it to keep the energy level. And that's like, all right, I'll, I can, I can talk for about 30 seconds before I need a cut. And so I just put a little video clip right on top mm. of it. And then I figure out how to, you know, end a sentence and how to start a sentence in a way that it's, it's not just trying to you know cobble together two sentences. It's in the filming process intentionally. This mm-hmm. is how I need to end a sentence so that I can pick back up energetic. So it's not super obvious that there's a cut there. And so that's where a lot of people are like, well, how do you do a take talk that fast for that long? Like, well, uh, that's not there's exactly. A cut. There's a strategic cut there. Yeah, there's there's a lot of intentionality in exactly how this kind of plays out. So as, as I maybe shouldn't admit all this. It's taken away the magic. Uh, it's okay. You're- <laughs> Your your personality shines through, anyways. What do you, what are you cracking open? This is a wild cherry Pepsi. Oh, look at you living on the wild side. <sighs> <laughs> so you dropped earlier. At, congratulations! You're you're uh, going to be on Rotten Tomatoes now. Yeah. No. It, well. <laughs> oh, I have explain. A, explain. I have been on Rotten Tomatoes for I think a month now. Is through your video reviews? Through my video reviews. Okay. So they pull that and then put a line in there that's like blah, 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 yes. blah, Sean Chandler talks. Today, the review I posted of Hobbs and Shaw is the first time I have actually posted one of my reviews on Rotten Tomatoes. Huh. So I have been on Rotten Tomatoes for about a month. I found out I was on Rotten Tomatoes about two weeks ago. Well, congratulations. Uh, thank you. Thank you. And that's how I found out. Someone messaged me, a fan. Hey, congratulations on being on Rotten Tomatoes. Like, what? What are you talking about? And so I assumed the guy was an idiot because I'm a jerk. <laughs> I, I just assumed the worst of people. Like, hey, people congratulations. Are dumb, yeah. It's like, and I'm like, I'm not on Rotten, Rotten Tomatoes. What is this guy talking about? So like, I'm going to look this up. I'm going to like, 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 dude, this is what you saw. That's not me. Mm-hmm. And then I go to Rotten Tomatoes and type in my name and my face pops up. What? <laughs> what? <laughs> okay. Um, and I look at it and it has 38 of my reviews. I'm like, okay, what? And then I look at the scores and I was like, all right, those are the right scores. And then there's little quotes and they're my quotes. I was like, what is happening here? Why? How are there 38 of my reviews on Rotten Tomatoes? Like, this is like the most prestigious thing of my entire life. I am on Rotten Tomatoes. I am an actual movie critic. I've just thought of myself as a doofus that can talk into a microphone and trick people into thinking I'm an art- articulate through tricking, covering up my cuts. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm on Rotten Tomatoes. What is going on here? You're part and of the Illuminati. I, like I am the Illumin. I'm the one that's getting that Disney money now, and I that's didn't even I know I was getting. The, I'm not, I didn't even know I was getting my Disney money. Who's who's getting my checks? <laughs> yeah, I was going to say you, you, so, how you liking the Disney money. You must be living <laughs> sitting high on the hog. Yeah, right. <laughs> so, uh, and especially because they had my uh, Spider-Man Far From Home review up on there, and I was like, I did not get it. And, and Toy Story Four, I have not seen my checks for those yet. <laughs> so I'm like, what is going on here? And so I have a friend that's on there. And I asked okay. her, hey, can you give me a contact information? Like, I don't know what happened. Like, I don't know if the, I lost the email. What happened here? So I emailed them and the lady's out of town on vacation. It's like, okay, well, okay. Real, seriously, I'm on Rotten Tomatoes. I have to wait a week for this lady to get back from vacation. I wait a week. Mm-hmm. She comes back and I email her like, hey, what's going on here? She's like, yeah, it's actually kind of weird for us too, because we've been emailing you for the last month and you've been responding. What? <laughs> what? I'm like, <laughs> um... No, we haven't. Like, yeah, yeah, we've been emailing you. So we're just as confused as you are. We're going to check on a couple things. So I'm like, what is going on here? Like, um, and, and who here's am my, I? Here's, who, here, who yeah, is me? Here's <laughs> in my, going through my thoughts of like, okay, this happened a lot because I was an alcoholic for three years. There was a lot of weird, it's, but I haven't had a drop of alcohol in three years. What is going on? Like, am I just going crazy? Because I, like, I have not been talking with these people. Mm-hmm. And I had that going through my head. Like, am I going crazy? Like, how did I forget something? Was I in cough medicine? Like, what happened here? Mm-hmm. And then they email me back like, all right. So basically, we have two applications for you here on Rotten Tomatoes. One is for the email address. That's my 
one that uses that me and you actually interacted with okay. that uh, you know, has my name in the URL. I mean, it's yep. very clearly I paid for this email address. And then the second application is for someone that Sean Chandler talks about at, you know, one of these email free email deals. Sure. That's the one they accepted. <laughs> As they should have. Yeah, of course. <laughs> and so they, they email the, the person. They, they accepted the one that was at AOL. Like, yeah, this yeah, guy yeah, yeah. clearly still exactly. uses dial up AOL. Yeah, this is probably right, Sean right. Chandler. Like, all right, all right, which one of these looks more legit? The person that paid for <laughs> them or the guy that has the free one? <laughs> right. So they, and so they start emailing the free guy. So they, they, the lady emails me and she says, hey, we got the two applications. We've been respo- e- emailing you at freeemail.com and you've been responding back. And so, you know, which one of you, these two email addresses that you have, do you want us to keep using? <laughs> and I was like, uh, <laughs> dude, come you, on. <laughs> you, you seem like a wonderful, very kind person that wants to help. Yeah. Uh, I've never emailed you from that other address. I've never had control of that other address. I don't know who's emailing you from that other address. I have no idea what's going on. That is someone else impersonating me. Fraudulently, right. they are an imposter speaking to you as me. That is not me. This email address that I'm emailing you from is me. That's why. Mm-hmm. I, why that's the whole point of all of this. And I should add to it: um, it's a little bit disconcerting and disturbing that someone is impersonating me, and that they were able to catfish Rotten Tomatoes to get me onto the website. Me applying as the person that is me could not get on. Mm-hmm. Person catfishing. <laughs> You got got, on. got me on there. Well, you know what though? You know you've made it when someone feels like they should catfish you. Right, and start right. using your identity to start getting things for themselves. Right. Like they might start using your identity to like find women and like you know those catfish that show on MTV where they're gonna like use your identity to find women and then the women will be like, oh my god, YouTube Sean Chandler <laughs> is trying to like get with me. Oh my gosh, do who do I bestow this honor? And that's what's so goofy about this is that – I mean on Rotten Tomatoes, it I don't write reviews for Rotten Tomatoes. I don't just right. like click rate movie on Rotten Tomatoes. I only can post on Rotten Tomatoes when it links to a review on my channel. Like okay. Sean Chandler, the person, doesn't mean anything to them. It's Sean right. Chandler talks about the persona, the YouTube channel that has credibility inside of a space. So this person, mm-hmm. I'm assuming they're they're just a fan – with the best intentions that, you know, committed fraud on accident. <laughs> like, um, they, so they were trying to help they, you out, maybe. Yeah, they're like, hey, I like Sean Chandler. I want him to be factored into Rotten Tomatoes. A bunch of people on here, they're a bunch of stuffy old critics, and Sean is a fanboy like us. I want him on here, so I'm going to play. I, I'm assuming that's what happened. So they mm. did that, and then, you know, for some re- reasons was responding to emails as me, which is very <laughs> weird. Hey, hey, it worked out. Uh, it somewhat. worked out in the end. It led to a yeah. couple of weeks of co- a lot of confusion for me. I thought I was going crazy. The lady over there, she thought she was going a little bit crazy and or thought I was like, who's this nut bar? Like, I've been emailing you for two weeks. Why are you acting like you don't know who I am? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but now I'm on there. So Hobbs and Shaw yeah. today was the first time I've actually posted on there. And it's 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 kind of a like so surreal that like I'm one of those people now. You're a critic. I was you're, deliver- the, you're the guy that everyone's are like. You're the guy now that fans are like. We know, don't listen to the critics, right? <laughs> don't listen to them. They don't know what they're talking about. All right, well, that's that's where I announced it on my <laughs> when I found out I was on there. Even you know, both uh, yeah, two three weeks ago, whatever. I, I posted on my YouTube page and like, uh, like, hey, the biggest thing. This is so cool. I'm on Rotten Tomatoes and um, just informing everyone. And of course you got those people in the comments like, dude, don't sell out. Sell out. <laughs> they do not pay me money. Like they, that absolutely right. does not happen. That is not what this is. What it is, is they are an aggregate. They go to right. people that put out movie reviews. So whether that's uh, the New York Times or an established YouTube channel, they're looking for people with credibility talking about movies and they just compile those together. They do not pay anyone. That their that would not business model would not work. Like, no. Don't sell out, dude. Like, dude, don't I know, do I, it. I, I, I always love when people are like, "You can't trust Rotten Tomatoes. They don't know what they're talking about." Like, they. This is like 
uh, first off, it's not like a person. This is a conglomeration right. of like it's an aggregate, as you mentioned. Like none of these people are talking. In, well, you know, some of you might some might know each other, but none of these people. It's not any one person. It's an aggregate. Right. So you can't be it's, like mad. At, you're getting mad at the, the the website for putting together an aggregate. Right. And, and it's <laughs> like, I mean, it's so decentralized. The problem is the exact opposite of this. Oh, there's a conspiracy to give Disney good reviews and uh, DC movies bad reviews. Like it's the total opposite of that, which mm-hmm. is like uh, to say that, like I just said, I was on there and didn't even know it. Right. And they upload, they, they, they watched my reviews and they just pulled out what they in, were, their interpretation of my score was and my quote was. And they were wrong on a couple of them. And mm-hmm. so I had to go back through and kind of fix it a little bit. Like it's the opposite of what people think. And it like there's no – like it's nothing at all like what people are describing. And like mm-hmm. oh, they don't know what they're talking about. Like I, d- you don't know what Rotten Tomatoes is. If you disagree with critics in general and think they tend to be out of touch – I probably mostly agree with you uh, mm-hmm. that I, I, you know, I'm probably too kind to movies, but I'm just too much of a fanboy. That's probably true. But there's a lot of people mm-hmm. that they, they seem to be a little bit too harsh on entertainment films. Sure. Okay. But, um, you know, this idea that Rotten Tomatoes has, uh, uh, it's like people don't realize that that's what that score means is that is the percentage of certified critics that recommend the movie. That's what right. the score means. That's all the score means. It's not a 99% doesn't mean the critics think this is the best movie of the year. That, right. It's just the movie that is the broadest appeal. The most percentage of critics said, I recommend that. The, 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 the rating I look at, if I'm looking at Rotten Tomatoes, is actually the average critic rating, which mm-hmm. is right underneath. Unfortunately, well, strategically, Rotten Tomatoes does post the, the, the tomato meter as front and center. But if you look on their site, you'll see the average critic rating. You'll be like, oh, mm-hmm. this is actually kind of the aggregate of what everyone thinks. Right. Yeah. And so, I mean, you take, you know, uh, well, I mean, the one that came out today, Hobbs and Shaw. So I probably mm-hmm. rated it very high, but that's because I'm a fan of big, dumb blockbusters. I, I love that stuff. Yeah. I love cinematic junk food. <laughs> but most average movie critics, they're, they tend to be more, they, they like the, more high art pretentious stuff. They're, right, they're right. more a lot more sophisticated than I. They're am. looking for that next Oscar. It, yes, that that's their thing. That's not really my thing. But so mm-hmm. then they see Hobbs and Shaw and they go, okay, yeah, this was a fun blockbuster, and they they recommend it. But they you know whatever their bottom recommendation is, mm-hmm. that's where most of them are at. Even the negatives are mostly there. It's either like, yeah, I mean, it's a lot of fun, but it's bad. Or they're mm-hmm. like, yeah, it's a lot of fun, but it's dumb. That's where you know mm-hmm. everyone basically is saying that about the movie. So they're all giving it like a six out of ten, mm-hmm. and some of them are giving thumbs up, some are giving thumbs down, and that means something so wildly different from the sorts of scores that you'll get for, you know, a Tarantino movie or right. you know, Midsummer a couple a month ago, where it's like people are like this is the best movie of the year. Some people hate it. It's polarizing. It's like love hate, or you know. Uh, you know, these Oscar bait movies where like these are this is an A plus, this is a ten out of ten. It just doesn't mm-hmm. mean that. It's literally just it's it's a binary scale, thumbs up or thumbs down. Like literally, when when I fill out my score for it, I write my my B plus or whatever, and then there's mm-hmm. just a little dial, fresh or rotten, one or the other. You pick one of them. That's right. all it is. <laughs> that's interesting. The the behind the scenes of rot. I mean, that's what oh, I yeah, that's what it, I figured it was. It in. It's very interesting, especially mm. with the way that people compile all these conspiracies and theory. And, you know, even like filling out my first review today, I was like, I posted my Hobbs and Shaw review on, on YouTube. And then mm. I went, oh, yeah, I probably should add that to Rotten Tomatoes. And I went over to go do it and I posted it and I went, wait a minute. I just did that for the first time. <laughs> Whoa. Like, I, I I mean, should I have like played epic music or something? <laughs> like, what? like that was just Fireworks. like, that was like such an important moment in my life. And it, I just kind of did it because yeah. it's just filling out a form. <laughs> like, it's, right. the, it's like there's, the least there's no red carpet for this. Right in. Yeah. And, you know, they told me they, they emailed me login information and then there's some trouble with my account. And so I had to troubleshoot with them. And they're like, can you reset your password a few times? Like it was as non um, uh, <laughs> spectacular of a process as possible. It was like, like the, their website's a little bit clunky in the way it functions. And you're like, oh, okay. 
It's just a website. <laughs> it's just yeah. It's just people. The, I, I do want to bring up real quick. Side note um, for the Disney stuff. I brought this up on my own show, but I'll bring it up again. Um, if Disney was paying Rotten Tomatoes, don't you think the three Disney remakes this year would have been rated fresh? Right. All of them are rated rotten on Rotten right. Tomatoes. Lion King, Aladdin, Dumbo. You would have thought those those are the movies that you'd be like, okay, we're gonna if I'm Disney, I'm gonna prop up my remakes because this is this is our bread and butter. This is what this is what we built our foundation on. Right. And I mean they're counting on at least right. two of those to be billion dollar ones. I don't think they thought Dumbo was gonna be a billion no, dollar film. No. But Aladdin and Lion King, I, of course they were. They were thinking these are gonna be the next Beauty and the Beast because you know it's that Disney Renaissance. Right. And yeah, exactly. I mean that's where this conspiracy theory is just 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 stupid. Like it, yeah, it's just, it just doesn't add up because you can look at every single year. Disney has rotten films. Right. And the prime example of for this is that Pixar movies and MCU films uh, pretty much always are fresh. All the MCU films are fresh. And right. Pixar is, uh, I think Cars 2 is the only rotten one. There might mm-hmm. be one more. And so people look at that and they say, hey, look, this is, they're, they're paying them off. Like, no, those are really two really good film studios. Right. They really do put out a good product. Like, if you think that, like, if Marvel's not for you, that that's fine. But the vast majority of people think that they put out a very consistent product. Mm-hmm. Formulaic at times. They are cooking with a lot of butter and sugar. They're throwing comedy in there. But they're putting out a really good quality product. Absolutely. That's, and that's what it, it – they're not – that those 90% for all these MCU films does not mean that these are nine out of 10 films. These right. are movies that most critics are saying they're seven out of 10 films. They're consistently seven or eight out of 10 for most movie critics. But because that's positive, mm-hmm. because they're like, yeah, this is a good blockbuster. These Pixar films, these are good family films. Therefore, they get fresh. Therefore, they're consistently over 80% on Rotten Tomatoes. That's what it means. And I just wish people understood that. Mm, absolutely. That, that now that we're getting into Marvel, this is how I kind of found you because I was on a, I'm a huge MCU fan. Um, I credit me too. The, it changed my life. <laughs> I was gonna say it. It this Which is helped weird me start to this podcast. <laughs> yeah, I would say. I mean, not to the extent I didn't quit my job like you. You you're going all in. Um, I didn't quit my job, but this is definitely it's made my. I feel like it's made my life better on the MCU. So. Getting into that, I was you know looking up MCU stuff, and I see your rankings. I'm like, oh, let me look at this, and then I hear look at your rankings, and I'm like, I might not agree with everything, but he has credible things to say to back up his points, and that's something I can respect. It's not someone just be like, oh, this, 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 this. You have reasons for why you do what you do, and that's so, what's interesting to me. Yeah, like I don't care about what numbers next to a title at all, and that's good. I don't really people care. Assume, people assume like, oh, you make number list, you have your, your favorites, like. Rankings are a fun, consumable way to talk about movies because it's comparative language. So inherently inside of it is like, why did you do this? Or I have this one here. And so it makes for a good conversation. And that's what I wanted for my YouTube channel is to spark conversations. Mm -hmm. But you encourage it at the start of all your videos. And that's what it's all about is that that back and forth conversation. And that's what what drives me crazy, 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 crazy. When I make a video and on my MCU rankings, I go back and forth between making them like 10 minutes long and making them 25 minutes long. Mm-hmm. So I'll put out the one that's 25 minutes long. So basically I'm putting a, a, a 90 second review for each of these movies, minute 90 second review for every single one of these movies, explaining why it's ranked where it's at. And then people in the comments are like, why is this ranked below this? <laughs> well, it, I, I, I just said so. Yeah. And I just told you like, I can elaborate if you want to ask me what my issues were with uh, why I can elaborate and -hmm. I can point you to all the videos where I've elaborated. But if you just say, why did you have Endgame below Infinity War? I I, I said that as clear as I could in the video. Like I know a lot of people have Endgame as their number one. And so I paused and when putting together my thoughts, I went, I want to talk about why Endgame is at number one. Mm Because I know that's the number one question people are going to have when they watch this video. Mm. So it's it's built in there. Like I say, my exact issues with Endgame. You know what the cure to that is? And I I know you. we talked about this off the air. The cure to that is, and it, it won't cure it fully, but you can certainly talk. You need to start your own podcast, bro. It's true. You need to start your own podcast because then you can go as long as you want and you can get as in-depth as you want on every single ranking. Yes, and uh, uh, funny you should bring that up. That's <laughs> that's literally my next thing that's coming for, for my channel. Um, 
So I told you this before we started, but um, the mic I'm using right now, it's the first time I've ever used this mic, and I'm using it with one of those broadcast arms that you see in the on the YouTube channels with a podcast where they look like they're super professional and slick. Yep. I bought one of those three days ago, set it up last night, and you are – this podcast right now is the first time I'm using all of this because I'm looking to start I'm a so podcast. I'm, I'm, I'm about – uh, I'm about six weeks out from launching a podcast kind of exactly basically to be able to have the longer form discussion, taking the conversations that I'm having in the comments that I'm having on Twitter, on Instagram mm-hmm. and have a place to, to continue the conversation. Talk Absolutely. about the stuff that there's not a good way to follow up on, on my channel. It's not like, Oh, okay. A lot of people are asking me about this. Right. I'll make a video about it. no, that. That'd be a weird video. Right. Fits perfectly on a podcast. Yeah, long and, form conversation. And one thing that uh, gets tr- tr- so at the end of every month, I do a video where I rank every movie I saw that that month. And mm-hmm. so, in theory, that could just be a rehash of my movie reviews. But it's only about fifty percent rehash of my movie reviews, and it's about fifty percent continuing the conversation. Mm-hmm. Because uh, especially now, I see most movies at press screenings, so I put my thoughts out there before I know how anyone else is responding to it. So, mm-hmm. like, I went to go see Spider-Man Far From Home five days before look it came out. Look at getting the press screenings. I'm sorry, what? I said, look at you getting into the yeah, press that's, screenings. That's been that's been pretty cool. <laughs> that that's that's the fun side of it. What's cool about those is I, I get to bring a plus one, and that's really oh, nice. cool to get to bring your friends along to that. That's a thing that's uh, kind of like making my way through my friends to be like, hey, you know, you really, you know. I didn't get to bring someone to Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, but like, hey, you were like Tarantino, right? Yeah, I like Tarantino. Mm. Want to go see the movie two days before it comes out? Yeah, yeah. how much will that cost? Free. That's and we'll awesome. get specialized seats. Uh, we can show up late and we'll be right there dead in the center. Like, really? That's really cool to get to bring your friends, that sort of thing. But so I see Spider-Man Far From Home five days before anyone else sees it. And I was mm-hmm. positive on it, but I had a lot of issues with it, too. Mm-hmm. And so then I just kind of put my idea, like my issues with it out there. And most people responded pretty well to my review when I first posted it. But then after people started seeing the movie, people are treating me like I've just been trashing it, which I didn't trash it at all. Mm -hmm. I just had specific issues that I brought up and I have seen it two or three times since and continue to have those problems with the film. Mm -hmm. And even just today, I I posted on my Instagram a picture of my new microphone and the boom. It's like, hey, look, next phase, next phase of the channel is coming up. And someone down in the comment section was like, dude, I can't believe that you like the Lion King more than Spider-Man Far From Home. Like, well, I mean, I liked it like one pinch more than Spider-Man Far From Home, but I've always loved the Lion King. And I, I don't, I know a lot of people didn't. And I saw the Lion King a week before everyone else. And so I watched it. I was like, this is really cool. It's hitting all the, it's hitting all the right nostalgia for me. Like I, mm-hmm. I'm digging this. I like John Favreau. I like the look of all of this, the photo reels. This is really cool. Then the movie came out and people were like, this sucks. It's a shot for shot. I was like, I didn't know. It. Like I just gave my honest take on the movie. And, uh, and so people are like, oh, you're crazy. Like I'm not, I just had a different opinion. <laughs> right. but, but so I put out my review before the conversation. Mm-hmm. The podcast makes it so then I can have the conversation. Right. Then so, you can have the conversation after and then go back and forth with people. And, and yeah, so when people are like, how did you like this? Didn't you have an issue with this, 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 and this? Like, huh, I hadn't thought about that. That's true. Right. Well, let's talk yeah. about that. I'd love to talk about that with you. Are and you going to do it solo, this podcast? Uh, or are you going to have someone on with you? The starting point will be solo. I don't okay. want needing to have someone else be the a weight holding me back. Mm. I, I I work much better as kind of you know a force of nature in and of myself. Uh, gotcha. If I can just like plow down in my mind, make this happen, I, I'm much more likely to make forward progress than if I try and partner with anyone. Have you do, um, been doing your research and finding like host sites and all that stuff? So that's what some a lot of what I'm working on, and that's where okay. I kind of set it out in the. A certain amount of time in the future. And I've done a little bit of podcasting stuff before. Failed at all of it, but you know, mm-hmm. I failed at doing YouTube for five years before it took off too. Sure. Uh, and then I, you know, I, I put, actually put up my first movie bl- uh, website in like 1998. Um, so it took me 20 years to be an overnight success. So just be patient, <laughs> keep working at it. If a website doesn't work, try a blog. If a blog doesn't work, try a podcast. If that fails, go to YouTube with, and then fail at that for five years and then you'll do it full time. Well, I, well, if you have questions, I'm happy to put you in touch with my podcast partner, Imran, and he can help you out. I, I you might up. have a lot of those questions this next month. I, I very, yeah. like, There's some of those specific things I, I definitely might have some questions on, especially yeah. the self-hosting verse using one of these other sites. That's mm-hmm. the big one. But but anyway, so that's what I um, 
very much want to have the, have a place to have those conversations. Also a place to just the nature of YouTube mm-hmm. is that, you know, I can put out one, I don't want, I'm trying to put out just one video per day. So I don't, you know, burn myself out trying to crank out too much. You know, mm-hmm. there's some ex- exceptions, but, uh, it, but there's always stuff to put out there in which case it's, it's driven by the urgent. Mm. It's always what's the most important video and what's the video that you get the most views and what's the most demand. And there's a lot of, not a lot of time to pause to talk about things that I think are more beneficial for people, but there's not a, it's not a video that would get a lot of clicks. Mm-hmm. And so like, you know, you talk about. Yeah. How do you balance that? And, and, and on the channel, I don't think there is a lot of a way to do it. Um, you know, you find your niche and you need to do what you need to do to, to kind of make progress, but there's so many other ways to expand my brand that, that are formats that lend themselves to more content and touching mm. on other things. So like my, my idea for the podcast is I'll probably record it live on my channel is what I plan to do. Oh, okay. Live stream it, live stream it. That'll be the That'd initial, be the initial version. So it's also a little bit more of a interactive. Commun- yeah. community activity, interactive, probably take a couple questions at the end or something like that. But uh, the, you know, the idea of kind of record it on the channel and have this kind of platform to, if I want to make movie recommendations, there's just not a really a way to do that with the way I do things right now. Like put yeah. out a weekly video recommending things. I, I don't, I don't think that that would be the, you know, the best standalone video, but in a podcast, people would be very receptive to that. So that's a, that's a lot of stuff that's kind of been on my mind of how to uh, take what I'm doing now and do the more personal version. Cause build even the brand. It, build the brand and you know, I, 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 there's a way in which my personality comes out in my, my channel currently mm-hmm. in my rankings. But there's a lot that, you know, even as you, you've seen in this podcast, yeah, I, I can go off on these rabbit trails telling stories and things like that. I Absolutely. can't, I can't do that doing a movie review. <laughs> like, it wouldn't make any sense. If I'm no, doing a ra- we, we haven't seen this aspect of your personality on like your YouTube. Right. And that's, you know, uh, coming from, you know, doing, delivering weekly messages to teenagers. That's my backstory is telling funny stories. That's mm-hmm. what, uh, you know, and I, even to some of the stuff I've tried to like, I've even thought about, trying to get into stand up comedy just for the fun of it, just to, mm-hmm. to experiment. And so I've studied a lot of that and tried to work that into when I do public speaking mm-hmm. is develop some bits inside of even, I spoke at a comic con back in May and so I tried to develop a little section of it to be a little, you know, stand up routine or whatever for about two minutes. <laughs> How'd that go? Uh, it got people to laugh. I had this whole little bit go. of like, Hey, thanks guys for being here right now. You could be, um, Getting your, you could be getting your picture taken with Pamela Anderson or be here with me. I'm glad you chose me over her. And it's probably a little healthier. <laughs> I said something like that. I don't, know. <laughs> I don't remember exactly what it was. It was kind of, kind of offensive and I can't believe I repeated it now. But, um, <laughs> but I, I just kind of put some little, little things in there that I thought were like, that's a le- nice little joke. Um, and whatever I would say right now is probably a, a terrible version of it, but. <laughs> and, and when I've done in church world stuff, I've had some stuff that I thought was like, I, I really, I like what I did there. That was a really mm-hmm. nice setup punchline to tell a story. And there's no way to use any of that skill set doing a movie review. No, no, no. And even yeah. like I, like I feel like if in conversationally or as a public speaker, I'm a lot funnier than I am on my YouTube channel. And so I've tried to like add humor in, but I don't. There's not. I don't have a way to do that that feels normal for me. So I end up using like dad humor and a bunch of stuff. It's like right, this is cheap stuff to like grab people's attention, but this isn't my actually my sense of humor. In mm-hmm. some of my my Marvel rankings, I kind of been known for my puns. And I don't even mm-hmm. write any of those. I have some other people write. That's like, the, that's my team. I have a, a team of pun writers. That's the only team that I have. Like, hey guys, can you give me some ant puns? Here you go. Here's some ant puns. Like, these are perfect. These are very, very punny. <laughs> well, I think the podcast is a, a good next step for you because you can flesh out your personality more. And a lot of your videos, I mean, you can go 15, 20 minutes and. I got to admit, you know, as someone that look watches YouTube videos, when it gets to that high, I'm like, oh man, this was video is a little bit more of a commitment. Right. Maybe this right. guy should do a podcast. Right. You know, you know, that, that's, that's the, that's where my head is. It's like anything 10 minutes or less. I'm like, yeah, I'll watch that. If it gets to like 15, I go, jeez. Right. Do I have enough time to watch this? Do I want to watch this? It, that's somewhat very much on my mind too. Of uh, when I, when I you know, first started taking off, it was that mindset of like, I would never watch one of my videos. These are way too long. Right, and so right, then I right. started to cut them back to make content that other I, that I would watch. Right, and so that's when I first started getting traction. And then at the same time, I realized a lot of my videos that were longer were doing really well. So this this the video with the most views, the Marvel villains ranked. 
That one's over 20 minutes long. And so I went, okay, mm-hmm. all right, I need to think not what would I watch, that, though that's a useful thing to think about, but who, what would my audience watch? What, what can I do that's, I'm not, this is not filler. This is not mm-hmm. just a bunch of crap that's extended too long. If it's tight and I'm saying a series of new thoughts that are still articulate, I'm not repeating myself, and it's 25 minutes long, that's perfectly fine. Right. So what what does that look like for me? And especially with some of these numbered lists, especially as long as I've been doing this, those get pretty easy to to do because you – all right, I'm thinking about a movie. I'm going to review 20 movies. If I talk for each movie for one minute, a one-minute movie review, that's that's pretty easy to do. Right, right. Uh, now, what gets tricky doing that with all the Marvel movies is that they're all fun. They're all funny. They all have a great cast. Uh, like it's all kind of the same thing. So I was like, okay, how do I how do I come up with distinct language for each of these? But and how do I make each review not the same review yeah. for every single one of them, right? And that's that was kind of the somewhat the trick that trying to come up with what that angle is, so that I'm not just repeating. Oh man, this one's a ton of fun. It's very rewatchable. I love the cast. This one is but- also really well cast. <laughs> it's also has a great sense of humor. It's like okay, I'm I'm saying the same thing. But that's where it, and, and talking about these movies so much, and that's where people want me to talk about them from every single angle. It's like, okay, I have to keep digging deeper and find new ways to talk about them, and it, it gets tricky at a certain point in time. Well, here let's let's talk a little bit of movies, okay. specifically MCU. Um, what is it in your opinion that the MCU has succeeded at, where these other studios trying to make copy the MCU have failed at? Uh, I think it's that they have the right person running it. Feige. 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 That Feige. Yeah. he came from a background of both knowing the he produced like nine Marvel movies before mm-hmm. he took over the MCU. Mm-hmm. So he had this deep knowledge of Marvel. He had a deep knowledge of how to produce movies. And whether it was him or it was John Favreau, they cracked the code of the tone that they wanted with the first Iron Man film. And I don't know if that was luck. I don't know if they're or, just that good. But they, what do you think? How much you credit you give Downey too? Because that was a lot of him too. Uh, I mean that the magic of that film. Right. Uh, I mean, like right now, I'm like getting chills every time I think about what happened with that film, because Iron Man was not an A-list comic book character. He, yeah. He's like B-list. Exactly. Um, the average folk, average people did not know who Iron Man was. My wife did not know who Iron Man was, and she watched like the 90s X-Men cartoon. She watched all the Spider-Man movies, watched all the Batman movies. Right. And then the trailer for Iron Man came on, and she's like, oh, that looks really cool. Who's Iron Man? I was like, you haven't heard of Iron Man? I'm like, no, I haven't heard of him. I was like, okay. Have you ever read a comic book? No. So popular culture, nobody knew who Iron Man was. It, it was Spider-Man, X-Men, and Hulk as far as Marvel, right? Uh I'm saying okay. as far as like pop, the pop, most popular Marvel characters. Yeah. yeah. And then, you know, they'd, you know, and they'd been trying to do things with different characters, but, you know, you think of the ones that everybody knew who the Hulk was. Some of that because they had the Hulk TV show back in the right. 70s and the 80s. X Men had some very popular cartoons. And then Spider Man's just always been a very broad appeal type character. Right. But then all these other ones, they were trying to get him going. And so then they get the director of Elf, they get an ex con druggie. Right. <laughs> and. <laughs> You know, the, this producer guy that's never run a studio before, and they cracked the code on how to make an exciting, funny, heartfelt, serious comic book movie. Mm-hmm. And they can be faulted for repeating some of their formula. I mean, if you do 23 movies in 10 years, you're probably going to do a little, get a little repetition. Some of these characters are very difficult to translate. And so they've done an amazing job of taking weird characters and making them mainstream. Absolutely. But they cracked that code with Iron Man. And then you have Kevin Feige as the through line. But you really have all everyone as a through line. Uh, it sounds like there's a bit of a falling out with Favreau as a director in the MCU after Iron Man 2 with the way things kind of were handled. But yeah. obviously, he's still around. He was just in Spider-Man Far From Home and very, as present as ever. So they didn't burn their bridges. They just, you know, maybe he's like, I don't want to direct another one of these. I didn't like the way. Maybe. But um, I mean, with them bringing him back and and Natalie Portman, I'm like, man, they could they could mm-hmm. be men fences with anybody. If that they- seems as if <laughs> maybe Don 
Cheadle's going to be out and Terrence Howard's going to come back. Howard. Maybe Mickey Rourke will come back. Yeah, Who knows? We'll see what happens. Uh, and then they're going to yeah remove Mark Ruffalo and we're going to have Edward Norton and then our oh, minds geez. will explode. Our brains explode. But so, yeah, I think that Kevin Feige is the, the guy that is a respectable enough producer guy that you 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 believe in him. Mm-hmm. That you really go, I trust him to be the guy that has a little bit more creative control over the directors. Mm-hmm. And they were willing to do make some hard cho- choices. They cut Ed, Edgar Wright. Right. Like that's not – like that's – you learn, lose nerd cred when you cut him. You Absolutely. get a lot of people that are like, I'm not going to watch Ant-Man because you cut him. And then Pete, they'll take you know years of criticism. Like, of course, Edgar Wright would have made a better movie than Peyton Reed. Yeah, but would they have made a better MCU film? Right. Well, no. So they they did. They made a hard choice. We're going to make a movie that's probably not as good, but we're going to make a movie that fits better in our universe. So the universe is better. Mm. And, you know, it, all of this leading up to because they made those sacrifices, Ant-Man is incredible in Endgame. He's so important. When, I mean, he's he's the everyman he, character. He's the everyman character. He's pivotal to the plot. And it, all the, the ways that this kind of ties together. Would Edgar Wright have allowed Kevin Feige to dictate plot points that had to be inside of these movies to set up the scenario so they could have Endgame? Probably right. not. So, and they they're willing to do that. And so, the, I just think they they made some incredible casting in that first mm-hmm. set. I mean, all the casting all along the way has been incredible. But I think very early on they got did some just amazing stuff with taking a chance on Robert Downey Jr. who. Um, that is just the, the redemption of Robert Downey Jr. is just a one of the great Hollywood uh, stories. Now he's the biggest star basically in the mm-hmm. world. And beloved. Right. And everybody loves his redemption story. And uh, I know I don't know how old you are, but like I'm old enough to remember I'm him. I'm 31. You're 30, okay, so you're just a little bit younger than me. Yeah. And so like for me, I remember him as like this guy that was getting – when I first started being aware of Oscars and things like that, being aware of the fact that he was Oscar nominated for Chaplin. And then he showed up in the sequel to The Fugitive, U.S. Marshals. Yeah. And so he's this guy like I remembered him. And then all I heard about him for about seven years was he's back in jail. He He's on drugs again. Sure. And that's like these very formative memories about him. And then he was fired from being a side character on Ally McBeal. Which <laughs> when I heard that, I was like, oh, man, this guy was like 10 years ago. This guy was like. They thought he was the best actor of his generation. Like they thought this guy was going to be the real deal. He just got fired from Ally McBeal. And now he's who he is now. Yeah, that's incredible. Right. And that that's the magic of the MCU, I think, is that they they just you know, you think Chris Hemsworth, Chris Evans, all these people, they discovered most of them. They, I mean, they nailed their big three mm-hmm. right off the bat. Like the, the, the people that they were building this foundation on, they nailed it with those three guys. And you know, and Chris Evans to me, my first memories were not another teen movie, right? And or then the, the Human Torch, Human Torch, which is a, it was basically the same personality of just kind of the obnoxious, you know, jock dude uh, um, from not another teen movie. Right, and right. That's what I knew him as, and so they cast. You know, that guy was like, that guy's the douchebag. He's not the all-American hero. And then you see the movie and you go, wow. They, I mean, they really – they have nailed the casting. And I don't know if that's Kevin Feige's in these rooms and he just sees the magic. But they have consistently for every single one of these, almost every single one of them, just fe- plucked these people out. Or you think, you know, Chris Pratt uh, was the, the chubby side <laughs> character on Parks and Rec. Right. Like he was not a stud. He was like his character was the guy that looks ridiculous, has the ugly beard and is really funny, steals scenes for being stupid. And then they announced, yeah, that guy's going to be the new superhero. He's going to be shredded. He's handsome. He's like, what? Right. <laughs> what, uh, what? What's happening now? Well, they do a good job, too, of uh- – they always make really interesting casting choices. Like they'll cast someone that's probably a little bit more popular than the lead and they'll put them as a side character or the yeah, villain. Yeah, absolutely. And it's like, whoa, like I didn't think like, wait, Robert Redford's in The Winter Soldier? What right. it, what is he doing? What's yeah. his role? Glenn Close is in mm-hmm. Guardians of the Galaxy as the Nova Corps? Right. What? <laughs> well, you think like with Thor, right? the first Thor film, Chris Hemsworth, when that movie came out, 
all he was known for was the first 10 minutes of Star Trek. Yeah, where he, he plays, was the dad. He's the dad. And yeah. I remember, like, that movie was very important to me. I'm a lifelong Star Trek fan. And, um, you know, it was like this, a very emotional film for me when it came out sure. for a variety of weird reasons related to church world that make no sense. <laughs> it's just the, the weird ways that movies touch us. Um, mm-hmm. so I saw that movie and being like, who's this guy that like, he just has a presence. He popped even in that 10 minutes. Mm-hmm. That's all he was known for. And he's kind of skinny in it too. Yeah. And yeah, they're like, yeah, we that. cast that guy from the beginning of Star Trek as Thor. And then Natalie Portman is Jane. So, of course, Natalie Portman is huge. Yeah, huge. And Tom Hiddleston, once again, I, I didn't know. I have no clue what he was in before that. Right. And But then you got Natalie Portman. You got but Anthony the, Hopkins, Rene Russo. And they just yeah, you go everything. Anthony Hopkins as Odin. You're like, oh, damn, Rene Russo as Frigo. What the hell? Right. And, and even like Stellan Skarsgård, who's not – he's not them, but he's one right. of those guys that – you know, you remember it from all this stuff. You, oh, he's in Goodwill Hunting, and he like brings a credibility yeah, so that yeah, yeah. this new guy, who Chris, who suddenly all of them are kind of propped up by these great sidecasts, and they've just done that all along with these legacy actors, and even yep. you know, getting people that you would like, right, like you say, Robert Redford, or getting uh, Michael Douglas to Michael Douglas in Ant Man, Hank Pym, Hank Pym <laughs> like is Ant Man. And it just seems so weird that he's doing like this, like the comedy of the MCU. And he, that's the one that he, because you don't think of him as like the comedy guy right? or anything doing blockbusters at all. And he's totally in on it. He's doing the jokes and everything and having a ton of fun. It's like he elevates this material and you can buy him as this old, very angry, condescending man. Cause you're like, right. that's what you perceive him as, but exactly. he's in the movie, which is awesome. And he does interviews. And like before Ant-Man came out, he was doing like promo stuff with Paul Rudd. There's like this video of them doing this deal where they're like slapping their knees and stuff. Yeah. Saying, ants, they're they're ants. singing a hit, man. Yeah. They're, they're singing it. And you're like, <laughs> they got Michael Douglas to do that. And so they, it's not just that they found these people to do this stuff. They, they found them and got them to be all in on it. Yeah, they've gotten them excited. to buy in. Yeah. And like, like Michael Douglas, when he talks about this, he's like, oh, yeah, I mean, of course I've never read a comic, but, you know, it's so much fun to do something that my grandkids love. Like, right. I'm in one of those, like, they don't care about any movies I've made until I did Ant-Man. And now they, my kids actually care about, or my grandkids actually care about it. It's like, like that's such a fun story of uh, with some of the stuff. He's like totally in on it for his grandkids. They've They've gotten to the point where it's like, People are just like fan casting actors and actresses in the movies, and you can like you can almost believe like, yeah, they could probably get that person. Right. Like people are talking about like Keanu Reeves, like oh yeah, Keanu Reeves, I could see him in an MCU film. You know, I mean, the, some of the casting with Eternals is like, what the hell? Right, Salma Hayek, Angelina Jolie, what are we doing here? Well, and you kind of look at it when you're they've got this many franchises, we're so many years into this. Yeah. And I mean, how many people are, are left out there for some of these roles? Like you start right. going, I, I mean, I guess they have to show up in the list right. of uh, of people to call. OK, I guess Keanu Reeves probably is going to show up in one of these two universes. Right. It's almost like especially with where he, this resurgence that he's had this year. Yeah. Um, it would seem foolish if he the way that he keeps riding this wave is, yeah, we got John Wick four in two years. And we got Bill and Ted next year. And then the year after that. He shows up as Adam Warlock in Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2 oh or whatever it is. Right. And you, th- you think through it and you go, well, I mean, that just sounds just like an obvious career move for him to, sh- to show up in one of these. Like, it's, it's like kind of what you have to do now. And yeah, it's everyone, like everyone has their cameo. Him. Right. I mean, Stallone was in a Marvel right. movie. And that's, <laughs> I mean, actually, you, you make me depressed if you bring that one up to me. Oh, but, you didn't like that one? So, oh, you did rank that low, right? Oh, well, so Stallone's probably my favorite actor. Okay. So if they announce tomorrow that they're going to... Were, were you shadow boxing as a kid growing up? I, I mean, I'm shadow boxing as of this morning when I was at the gym. <laughs> I, I, I haven't stopped. And that's not a joke. Like I, when yeah. I'm at the gym, I'm punching the weights and stuff. I'm and you're still playing going. that music in your head? I, I, earlier today, I was playing Hearts on Fire from Rocky oh, Four. I mean, I'm, I'm that guy. I am, <laughs> I'm all in. And none of this is jokes. This is all true. Uh, I was listening to Hearts on Fire earlier today. Rocky Four is one of my favorite all-time movies. It's, it's, it's it, so bad, but it's so fun. Well, it's an 80s product more than right. a movie. Yeah. If you think is this is like a thing that could only exist in the eighties, it's incredible. It's, it's the it's, Rocky superhero movie. Yeah, it, exactly. It's it's a yeah. revenge movie. It's a superhero movie. Uh, it's it's everything that I love about the eighties all wrapped up in one, uh, including Hearts on Fire. Hearts on Fire, all of it. <laughs> and and the, the sequel song to Hearts on Fire, that's the score. I didn't know. There's two different sound. There's the there's soundtrack. Two songs. The, yeah. It's two songs, and in the movie they transition together when he starts running up the mountain. It's called Up the Mountain. So then when I'm at the gym, like, I'm like, all right, I gotta like, I'm lifting weights, hearts on fire. We got to get into the song. I gotta switch over in my, to the other album 
so yeah. that I can transition into the part where I climb up the mountain as I put up right. more weight than I've ever put up before. And, and you raise two fists and yell Drago at yeah. the end of it at the end of it and at a gym. Everyone around me is like, "What is wrong with this guy?" Drago. It's like that guy's way too much into Rocky. But so um, <laughs> the little kid's like, "Who's Rocky?" <laughs> right. And then you just want to kill yourself. Oh my god. <laughs> uh, so they, they put out a new. I, I got to get back to your question because I expanded yeah, yeah. better. But, but I have a rabbit trail before I get back to being off these rabbit trails. Uh, so they put out a new Rambo poster yesterday, and I on my Instagram I just shared it in my stories, and I had someone mm-hmm. message me, "Who's Rambo?" Oh my I, gosh. I, was like, I don't. I don't know how to respond to this. Like I'm so, trying yeah. so hard to not be. My actual personality, like my my brand is being a nice person. I'm actually really condescending. I am, I'm not nearly mm-hmm. as nice as I come off. Um, and I'm like trying to like, okay, mm-hmm. how, do, uh, how do I respond to someone that doesn't know? What do I do? This guy doesn't know who Rambo is. What do I do? And so I tried like, it's actually one of the biggest uh, action movies of the 80s. Like, I thought Terminator was the biggest action movie. Like, oh, no, come on. Uh, what? Oh. Well, you're killing me right now. Not the same actor. Yeah, not the same actor. <laughs> and technically speaking, Rambo 2 would made like four times as much money as the first Terminator movie. Terminator 2, Terminator in the 90s, yeah. that one comparable money to what what uh, Rambo First Blood Part 2 did. And anyway, anyway. <laughs> so I loved Guardians of the Galaxy, the first one. Yep. Um. Guardians you didn't like vol- two as much. Guardians Volume Two is the for me the most disappointing movie in the MCU. See, I liked Volume Two a lot. I <laughs> I like that it makes you pause. You're like, oh, uh, uh. You can, we, you- well, some of it is that for two years, over two yeah. years now, I've had people just crapping on me for not liking it. That was oh, you- my most anticipated, second most anticipated movie of that year. It was like going back and forth that and Star Wars. Uh, which is to tell you everything in the world. Like this movie is side by side with Star Wars. I'm not really sure. Depending on which trailer dropped last is the one I'm anticipating more at this particular moment. That's how excited I was for Guardians Volume Two. And I mm-hmm. just, I just, there's a, I, you know, I've talked about it extensively in my my videos, but they, I just did not like the the story. I didn't like what they did with the Star Lord mythology. I didn't like the tone. I thought it was mm-hmm. just too mean spirited. I didn't. Sure. The humor went too cartoonish. It would like we do like Looney Tunes humor and dancing Baby Groot, and then tortured Baby Groot, like grown men torturing a child. Right, and and, guy, and guys getting thrown out into space, space while their friends are laughing, suffocating. Yeah, and so that, that stuff like that that I just it it kind of put a sour taste in my mouth. And I sure. and it's like I can watch very harsh movies and be fine with it, but when you're you're the what the specific recipe that it was going for where it was going that mean spirited and then that cartoonish it didn't land for me sure uh some of the stuff with the nature of the ego plot line about star lord having uh you know find, meeting his dad an orphan finding his dad that he's looking for only to find out that it, you know his dad killed his mom that he mm-hmm. had thousands of siblings that have all been killed by by his dad uh, that's just a, it's just kind of distasteful. It's not just like evil villain. It's like, that's kind of gross. And like, let's make Star Lord a god just long enough for him to make a, a baseball, throw it to his dad, and then he has to lose it. Sure. Like, that's like, it's, it's all kind of weird to me. To, like, it's straight, very strange storytelling. So I, I, so that's, I appreciate it, your justification. I actually, I like this. And so that's where to me, I, it's, it's really tough for me because I don't know how much of it is that the conversation about the film has been so kind of toxic where people have been rude in the comment section to me. Mm. That's kind of primed me to be like, I I'm just not into this. And so how you're sour on the whole thing. Almost. Some of it, like that's a, a, the conversation surrounding it. And yeah, you know, I, I had like a guy, actually one of the few times I did turn down being on a podcast, um, with someone who's like, Hey, I want you to, I'm doing a podcast of like, it's called love and hate. I'm getting one person that loves something. Another person that hates something to kind of duke it out. Mm. And he invited me on to do Love and Hate for Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2. And he wanted me to come on to be the person that hated it. And I was like, I don't, I don't enjoy doing that. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not that guy. Yeah, I'm not that guy. <laughs> like, I, I'm known for not liking it, but technically I gave it a positive review when it came out. Right. And that's just how much I love the MCU that it's one of my least favorite, but I still gave it a positive review. Mm-hmm. Like I said, the MCU changed my life. That's the reason I went full. Like, why would I dedicate my time to going full time talking about movies? Well, it's because even the one that is low on my list, I still like. Right. But like, I don't like to sit around talking 
bad about a movie, especially not Guardians of the Galaxy. Like I, that's, that was the first film was a very special film for me that I was just, it's such a pleasant surprise. So heartfelt. It was a movie. I, I went to go see it and I took my interns. I had summer interns when I worked at the church. And so I took all four of my interns to go see it opening day and we all loved it. And then the next day we went on like a service trip to go kind of help some impoverished people. So we're the whole week we were quoting the movie to each other. We we're just, you're just getting in circles and going, we are Groot. Yeah, we're, we're doing, we are Groot. Of course, I'm, <laughs> I, I was, even though I was a pastor, I still had a terrible sense of humor. So I decided to call one of my girl interns a green whore. As it turns out, that's not a good move. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> that didn't go well. Uh, that, that, Literally on Twitter today, I was talking with her about dogs. So we're still friends. It's, 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 it makes me sound way worse. Than, like I'm still very good friends, friends with that. Yeah. Really was there's was ne- never actually bad blood. You of, chauvinistic pig. Of the ridiculous things that I said that summer to her, that was not the most offensive. Which once again to go to my actual personality that when it comes out, uh, it, it can be bad. Um, um, but so it's just like a really special movie for me. I just I just loved it. It was like my, mm-hmm. it was 21st century Star Wars to me with a 21st century personality, but a lot of the stuff I loved about Star Wars. And so the second one, I didn't like it. It was and it was disappointing because they had my favorite actor in it. Um, even some of the side people, like M- Michael Rosenbaum, Lex Luthor from Smallville, he's in it right. as one of right. the the people on the co- team with Stallone. Mm-hmm. And so all that stuff was just a lot of fun for me. But the movie itself just really disappointed me. So I don't want to talk about that. I'm not. I'm not happy about the fact that I don't like it. I mm. all the people that loved it, I, I would much prefer to be you than me. Like mm. And that's to me where the conversation is really frustrating because I, I used to, when I would talk about it, I would preface it like, don't be mad at me. I wanted to like it, but those prefaces didn't do any good. People are still like, you're an idiot if you don't like this movie. Like, what? Okay. I mean, okay. Well, now we're not even having a conversation. Yeah. And, yeah. and that's, the, that's the stuff that, once again, like the number next to the title doesn't mean much to me. I want to talk about ideas. And so here are my ideas. Here's my thoughts on Guardians Volume 2. Let's have a back and forth if you want to talk about the movie, but calling me an idiot because I didn't like it. You're not make you're not helping. You you're mm-hmm. making me like the movie less because you're creating a negative attachment to the film, which is when I talk to people about this movie, they're they are they are mean to me, <laughs> which I don't yeah, enjoy. They spit that. vitriol at me. Yeah. And hey, let me ask you a quick question. Okay. Right, go ahead, go ahead. I was gonna say so talking about MCU. I've looked at a lot. I've, re- I've seen a lot of your videos. Okay. I don't know if we've gone. You've done this though. Okay. What is your favorite non-action small scene or small moment, small bit of dialogue? And I'll I'll give you an example of mine. One of mine, and then you can you can go okay. from there. Civil War, the scene where Steve and Tony are in the war room, or whatever they're the little conference room. And Steve is ready to make to sign the papers. Mm-hmm. It's like it, it has to be conce- you know concessions or whatever. I'm paraphrasing. And then Tony just a side note throws that Wanda's at Avengers Tower, basically locked up. And then they just have that little back and forth. And t- and Tony at one point Steve's you know chastising him. Tony just yells, "Give me a break!" And that whole moment where that, that that whole conversation, I can replay that moment over and over. I'm like, that's a real conversation between two guys yeah. that want to make it work, but for ideological reasons can't right. make it work in that moment. Right. So what are what and are some scenes like that? That for stuff you? to me, once again, is the magic of the MCU. That that's the best stuff. That, that's and that movie only works because of the shared universe. Because absolutely, you have you've had the years. You have the years of seeing Tony and his f- faults, and you have the years of Captain America seeing corruption. Right. And so then you get to these scenes and you know all of that. You can't do that in one movie. That, that, well, that, that, that's the, the best, yeah, I was going to say the best part about like that whole stuff, that, that buildup is Tony was the man that was anti government. You know, right. I created my own self defense. Like I've, I've privatized world, right. world, world peace and he's now working with the government. And Steve is the man that was so eager to join the mm-hmm. government. And now he's like, there's a lot of holes in this. I can't trust the government. Right. And, so it's that dichotomy. And in the context that Tony just cre- went cr- rogue and created Ultron. Right. And he's going to rethink his life choices. Exactly. And he's so, got to be put in check. And that's what he's thinking. And then what's the movie that just came before for Captain Winter America? Soldier. Winter Soldier. And he yeah. just went, I've been fighting for the government. I don't, I trust myself. They have agendas. And they have agendas. I trust myself and my friends. Right. 
And I don't trust this board of people. And, and then likewise, Avengers, where, wait, the government wants to blow up the city? Right. And they're the ones holding this against – wait, what? Steve's line, the safest hands are still our own. No. So favorite little scenes like that. Um, uh, um, Not to put you on the spot. <laughs> so the the one that's been pretty heavily on my mind is one that a lot of people would be be shared with. Kind of a bit of a bit of a final battle would be okay. the, the bookends of I am Iron Man. Okay. So someone asked me two years ago. I did a video talking about favorite lines, favorite moments in the MCU, and in my top ten was the original Iron Man film, the end of the film, where they just turned the superhero tropes on their head. Right, they just flipped it. Flipped it because it's always their it's their secret identity. Nobody knows who he is. So you get to the end of this movie, and it's like they're starting to figure it out. So it's like, oh, how's he going to outsmart them? How is he going to do this? Like, what's he going to do so that they he throws them off his trail? But that's not who Tony Stark is. This guy's a showboater. He he might have changed in his heart, but he's still the guy that wants to be on the. He wants to be the rock star. So what does he do? He just says, "I am Iron Man," and I just love that. Yeah. And then doing the full journey of this character, of everything that happens from him in the cave and, you know, this scientist guy saves him and sacrifices himself so that Tony could do something greater. And you play through all the things that happen throughout all these movies. And I went into Endgame and I kind of my predictions were that you can't kill off Tony Stark. Because you yeah, set, I think I saw that. You set him up to be someone that he's about to be happy. He's back with Pepper. He's about to get married, and he's talking about having a kid. You, and he had already done the sacrifice thing in the Avengers. He had already done the sacrifice thing, so you can't kill him off now. Going in, or going, yeah, going in Infinity War and uh, Endgame. That's kind of like like you can't kill him off because that doesn't feel right. That doesn't feel very good. Mm-hmm. And so then the movie happens. And they do a time jump and they resolve that problem because yeah. they gave him his happy ending that right. he, he got, got to live it. He got to live absolutely the, the peaceful married life with a child. And they, I mean, they stated in the movie of like, like everyone else is living the apocalypse and right. we're living the dream. And what's no, it to I- favorite moments? These ones right here, even what I'm saying right now of like when, as soon as I, that the daughter appeared, I went, Oh, they resolve my problem. He's going to die in the end. <laughs> like, well, well, quick side note: I'm like it, it's very interesting. Like they associated each character with like a different way of like grief. So like Black Widow is like doing F- in Endgame. Black Widow is doing everything she can to have her control over everything. Yeah. Steve is just is kind of ignoring it. Like he's like trying to like put it away, but it's like still seeping in. And, he's trying and to he's like the guy hope. helping everyone. Right, like, he's hey, I'm I'm counseling people, and hey, we move on. And he's putting the right. smiley face on, but Hawkeye is like just lost his mind. Basically, yeah. he's rage. like rebelling, rage, Anger. right? Hulk has like, okay, I got to do something different. I have found some sort of, I've got to transition my life somehow. Thor has like fallen off the wagon, and then Iron Man, who's the guy that I would have like going into this, I would have been like, man, like he's gonna be like in. He's going to be in the hole. He's going to be really messed up after this. Yeah. And he's actually the guy that's like, I found peace. Like, I and know this movie, terrible thing happened, but I found peace. And even in the first uh, act of the movie, yeah. he's a disaster. Like, he's right. as he's, a he's wreck. the most toxic coming out of every, like, every kind of what happened at the beginning of it. Like, right. the, just thrashing at them. Looking like, a, like, and they did a great, like, he looks like a cancer patient. Yeah. He's just in the worst shape ever. And... Then they, they and this guy that throughout all these movies has been the soul that can't rest, that mm-hmm. is just so conflicted in everything he's trying to do. Right. And then he's he's at peace and doesn't want to get back into it because he's like, I just I cannot lose all this. Right. And then all the the foreshadowing of Doctor Strange of there's only one way and right. I can't let you know what it is or it won't happen and oh, all these line. little all these little moments building up towards. You're you're going through this final little bit, and they're desperately trying to stop Thanos. And they they pause in the middle of it, and oh Tony Stark God. looks at Doctor Strange. Doctor oh, Strange knows what, kn- knows what needs to happen, and Tony probably at this moment puts it together like, "Oh, 
I, okay, I know what needs to happen, and I know how we'll this is the one in fourteen million. This is chance, the one in right fourteen here. million. It's it's the one thing that you know, I I definitely don't want to have happen right here, right? But this is it, and so then I am Iron Man in just really very nicely built torts to where you you could kill him off, and you mm-hmm. and, and it felt okay. Just well, they did a good job too. I was just gonna say they did a good job in that movie layering in like his closure like i thought i don't know how you felt about the time travel but them him going back in time and seeing his dad Mm -hmm. and then having that closure and that little moment where he like he's like it's gonna be all right everything's gonna work out the way it should and he hugs him and he goes thank you i was like in the movie already like i'm a wreck like this is this is a great moment well see if you kind of go through the film and you're like that all these things you you never would have thought we'd have in the movie or that you'd want in the movie or that it'd be the most sentimental of the films like right. uh, of Tony with his dad. Cause you've always, there's always been a certain respect there and a certain amount of conflict. And especially, you know, the second film kind of dove into that of how his dad wasn't great, but his dad also loved him. And also uh, hid the secrets to a new element in a map. <laughs> it's, it's, you know, obviously <laughs> that's the way to redeem yourself to your son. Um, <laughs> But so th- all, all of that just kind of really nicely, you know, that, that's the stuff where, you know, they just did a, a you know, great job with that film. Absolutely. They, I've made a really special film. I that, mean, that moment along tag team with Steve pausing in the office and seeing Peggy, I, mm-hmm. that little quiet moment, I was like, oh, they're hitting it. They're hitting yeah. the heartstrings right now. Yeah. I, uh, uh, after I saw it the second time, so I saw it at a press screening. And that mm-hmm. was for me like oh, press screenings. I've made it because I, I got in to see that one. That and if yeah. I, like I was actually nine months of work to get into that. Um, Side note: Do press screens are they just they're every city in America or like every major city? Like, I, you, I don't know. Which, I don't are, know. Is, they have they have come, some that come to Austin though, obviously. Yeah, so I, I would imagine if it's a major city that they have press screenings. Got it. Okay. So I don't know what the size on that is, but you know, Austin's a, a big city, the capital, growing of Texas. city. Yeah. Yeah, very quickly growing. It has been for thirty years. Yeah. Um. So, you know, we we have press screenings for you know almost all the movies, but they're normally pretty late. Like L.A. will have press screenings about a week before ours. Ours are normally Tuesday, right before the movie comes out, usually. Okay. Uh, whereas L.A. they're like two weeks, three weeks beforehand. But, and there's no. It's not centralized at all. It was. It's all hustle to get in on them. So like, I'm not on the universal press screening list yet. I'm oh, not. Okay. I'm not on Lionsgate's press screening list yet. So like, the way I got into Disney is that I went to Ant Man and the Wasp just with a public pass because they hand out public passes because they want to fill up the the theater for press screenings. So I you know, waited in a three hour line, got into the movie, and afterwards walked up to the guy running and was like, "Hey, I got a channel. I've got fifty thousand subscribers." Who would I talk to about trying to get on the list? And he, he's like, here, here's the email. Email this person. And that turned into like months. And, and so I emailed that person and I got about getting a Disney list. And instead I got onto the, the Paramount list and the WB list, but I didn't get on the Disney list. And it like, I don't know if it was a mistake. There was a person that left. A bunch of stuff happened, but I didn't get on the Disney list until uh, Disney Nature's Penguins two weeks <laughs> okay. before Endgame. <laughs> okay. Two weeks before Endgame. Like, finally got on like all this hustle and like, Hey, do you want to go see Disney penguins? Yes. I'll go see that. Yes. I will go to see that Disney movie, whatever it takes, whatever it takes. Yes. Whatever it takes. <laughs> got into that one. And then uh, like two days after that, they're like, you're invited with a guest to see Avengers Endgame." It's like, I've done it. I have you made, made it. it. You made it kid. But so I, uh, I, I saw Avengers Endgame press screening. Then I went opening night mm-hmm. and that's, that was a, that's a, I think for probably most people, that was a, probably a pretty screen special screening of a movie that um, opening uh, night of Endgame, one of the best screenings of just packed theaters people c- crying cheering standing up like clapping when oh my gosh Captain the America range of cra- emotions and just huge uh, you know in, in the somber sections the, the theaters silent and then you silent. just hear sniffling yep yep <laughs> and that's so rare i mean i like you know i've been doing this this youtube thing for three years and so i go to the movies two times per week Always mm-hmm. there, opening night for movies, and there's just never been anything in the ballpark of that in my three years doing this. I completely agree with uh, you. Just some, some, even you know, even being packed for for other Marvel movies, nothing even close. Or the closest thing to Endgame was Infinity War at the snap. 
That's right. the only thing kind of comparable, but even that wasn't the level of emotion that you had. It, with it wasn't the journey as Endgame, no, right? Not at all. It, it was the start of the journey when the snap happened, and then right. there was. Then you carry that baggage into in, Endgame, Endgame. Yeah. and so then that oh, and my like, you know, my I have a buddy Andy who's got a YouTube channel. He's a big creator from He's very energetic, and one of his theories in my video on my channel about Endgame was that Captain America was going to yield Mjolnir, and that was like nine months out. He's like, that was he, his theory. That was his theory. I mean, I'm sure okay. other people had it too, but he was the yeah. one that was like, the reason I said that in my videos is because he said it. And I went, yeah, that it, like that seems like such. If they did that, that would be incredible. That is, right. that would be so 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 amazing. So he's there with me, two seats over, and I'd already seen Endgame two days before. So I'm waiting uh, to see how people are going to respond to this. That's always fun though, too, that is was, knowing that, that knowing what's going to happen and seeing the response that, of others. And that's kind of, you know most memorable experiences watching a movie was watching Endgame for the second time because mm-hmm. you get to that third act and I'm just watching everyone around me. Yeah. So that hammer flies into Captain America's hand and my buddy Andy and I'm staring at him. I'm not looking at the screen. I'm looking at him and he stands up and starts clapping right there. <laughs> and like, yeah! And starts cheering and everyone else in the room is too, just losing it. And then, you know, two minutes after that, you know, Captain America on your left in his ear, and the well, even the right before that though, you get the you quick cut down to Thor it. going. Oh, well, you get the quick cut to Thor going. I knew. I knew. It. Yeah, right. <laughs> I mean, just like the perfect little things of like the the res- you know the response to Thor in Age of Ultron when he was trying to lift the hammer was like, uh oh, yeah, he, right. And but now we're in the moment where it matters. He's like, I knew it. Like, yeah, he's like he he's of, always of, been that guy. He's always yeah. been worthy. Of course. And then, you know, in his ear on the left and the portals start opening and, you know, my wife just starts bawling and just, and as it keeps on going on and, and Spider-Man swings out and just like the room is crying at this moment, just everybody's brought back. Spider-Man got the biggest applause for me when he came back yeah. in my theater. And I mean, just that that's uh, something really special. I mean, but like, that that's something that doesn't, you know, that's. 22 movies yeah. like that's not something that just happens overnight that, that's what's amazing about this is they've sustained this and you build to that moment where it's the portals scene and everyone's coming out and like in the back of your mind you knew they were all coming back right like these well, were all but but it, it still was amazing yeah, I mean, in that you, moment you knew that before you saw the movie and then yeah. in the movie at this point in time it's been 30 minutes since they it's been a f- confirmed that they brought yeah, everybody. They fixed it, but they did such a good job in the movie. Is is like they gave you enough payoff, of like we did it, and you start seeing the sun come out in in flies and birds, and right. and they used flies and birds to make you go. They did it, and then one phone call, and that's all we needed to have this emotional like, oh wow, they did it. So then they turn everything upside down and start shooting missiles at everybody. Yeah, then you see a missile coming and, at, and, and so then immediately you go into. Uh, um, action mode in urgent mode and so your mind while if we paused the movie and went let's take a quiz is everybody back yeah or mm-hmm. do we know where they're going to show up well of course they are but right. because we're in the moment we're in the urgent it works that you have yeah. this moment where everybody shows up and it works inside perfectly inside of the movie just brilliant storytelling of how knowing how people actually experience a story and how to have two payoffs with the same exact snap of bringing people back. But so anyway, so that was just a real special night uh, mm-hmm. at the movies and, and, and week really not. It wasn't that night. It was that whole, yeah, week. that was your whole week. I, and I kept trying to go back and they were always sold out. I mean, it was just constantly sold out every single showing for a week, mm-hmm. every theater around me. And my wife didn't want me to take my son to go see it. Uh, How old is your son? He's seven. So okay. she's, you know, she's not off base. Mm-hmm. But she's not entirely on base either. So, <laughs> uh, so I was seven and saw Batman 1989. And you know that movie oh, was, that's way darker. That's than- way like joy buzzing people and acid in the face. <laughs> right. And so she was worried that, you know, it's, it's long. It's pretty heavy at times. It's like, I'm going to go at four in the afternoon. It's been out a couple weeks. There's not going to be a lot of people there. Mm-hmm. And the the thing to me is this is a cultural event. Absolutely. This is like I, 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 even on this channel, I talk about it constantly. Batman eighty nine. I've got my cards right next to me. We're talking about it right now. I just mm-hmm. told you I saw Batman eighty nine in the theater when I was seven. And this is a much more important movie. That movie's incredibly important. Mm-hmm. This is like 
all the momentum that that movie was responsible for. Here we are 30 years later, that much more so. This is a cultural event. This is a movie people are going to be talking about. And he doesn't know that right now. He's not like he didn't watch it like my mind's blown. Mm -hmm. But he'll be able to say that his whole life. I was there. He saw that moment. I was there when it first came out. I can say that I saw it in the Mm -hmm. movie theater. And that was important to me. And so she she talked to one of her friends and her friend's like, yeah, you know, go at the right time of day. Promise that he starts getting emotional. Like, okay, I'll do all that. Whatever. <laughs> yeah, give me a take. He'll be fine. And he do was you fine. Think, do you think with the upcoming Slade, and I'm sure, I know Faye has plans and all that, do you think they can recreate this magic in the next two, three phases and make another big cultural moment? I mean, you know, they're, they've had the Black Panther was a big cultural moment. I'm sure... Shang Chi will be a big moment. I'm sure Thor: Love and Thunder will be a, a big moment as well. Um, but do you think they can rebuild this into another set of Avengers movies that then become an end game? It's tough to say. Uh, yeah. the, so they announced Phase it's Four. It's unprecedented. This whole thing. right. Like there's there's nothing comparable to what just happened. Right. Because even if you take you know the importance of Return of the Jedi 35 years ago as three movies. Right. This is a lot. This is so much bigger than that. Um, and they had time to play. Like the time factor allowed them to build hype, whereas Marvel is not going to allow twenty years of time to pass right. before they make another Marvel movie. Right. And so, yeah, it's tough to say. So they announced their Phase Four. Right. And nothing in Phase Four is going to be in this ballpark. And I think no. they, they knew. Like they went. All right, we are we have as big of a wave as anybody has ever had. We have as much credibility that we're gonna do a bunch of crazy weird stuff. This is their experiment it, phase. It, it like you look at it, and every single one of these is a, an experiment. There's right. nothing normal inside of it. It's all right. like you're like let's do Thor with she Thor or whatever. Like right. every single one of them is an experiment. And I, I mean, even though Natalie Portman's like a good, pretty good actress, it's like she hasn't been impressive in these Marvel right, movies. No right. one was clamoring for her to come back. Right. So this is, you know, they're taking a gamble on this. Right. The whole, the whole phase is a. Right. They, they, they know that they have the credibility to do bonkers stuff. Even the Disney Plus stuff is like, are people going to subscribe to Disney yes. Plus? Is this going to be a thing? Like, what's going on? And so, it's tough to know. I'm assuming – or whenever they announce Phase 5, I think that's when we'll get a better idea of is this – how are they going to rebuild some of this stuff? And then likewise, you're, you're just kind of waiting. That it's a numbers game. Eventually, one of their movies is going to be a total dud. And you just don't know when yeah. that's going to happen. When is that going to yeah. happen? <laughs> like it, it's just you – know, we're 23 of these and every single one of them is fresh on Rotten Tomatoes. Absolutely. That's yeah, unfounded. Exactly. There, there, there's nothing comparable to that. Right. That level of consistency and quality. And I would agree with it. Like I like I hear that I and I go too. like as as much as I think that Thor the Dark World is the worst of the the Marvel movies, it, it's not like it's it's still a well produced film. It's right. just mediocre as can be. Right. It's just yeah, it's exactly. It's just the middle, right in the middle. Right there. Right there in the middle. Right. And nothing there really to make you mad when people oh I hate Thor the Dark World. No, you don't. It's yeah. just, it's just the le- your least favorite. They took no risk with any characters. Yeah, How could you hate that? <laughs> right. It's it's just it's just there with pretty faces, pretty visuals, and a little little drab visually, but sure. pretty faces, great special some effects, humor. some yeah, some one liners that really work. Right. It's totally mediocre. Right. So so eventually they're gonna bomb. But so if they announce they it's pretty easy to see, you know, D twenty three this year or Comic Con next year, they're like, here's phase five. Mm-hmm. In 2022, we got Fantastic Four. 2023, we have X Men, and with another Spider Man, Captain Marvel, Black Panther, and you go, whoa, like that, like Guardians, Guardians three. three, and you can see very easily where the lineup for 2022 through 2025 is. You know, all of these sequels to b- billion dollar films plus X Men, which people are going to go bonkers because right. it, it. Some of the reason I think X Men's lost momentum is that. They they stretched out a franchise too long because they did a trilogy of actual X Men and then they spent fifteen years doing basically side projects with the right. first class, yeah. and so it's not really the lineup that you want for the X Men. <laughs> so it was, it's like it's kind of the X. I mean, it's X Men, but it's not when you think the X Men, the A team. That's not right. what it's been. 
Well, and they kept rehashing the same yeah, like re- mutants yeah. are like it's an allegory to racism. Uh, you got Magneto and uh, Professor X, two sides of the of two sides of a coin. Yeah, over I mean, it's, and it's over same, and over and over. And so they 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 were just kind of in a rut for a very long time. And I and I love a lot of those films, and a lot of them are just just so. Come on, guys! What? Why are you doing the same thing over and over again? Right. And so you think Kevin Feige doing his magic with the X Men? It just seems that just seems amazing. Likewise, mm-hmm. people want a good Fantastic Four film, and, I agree. and Kevin Feige can easily make one. It's like the fact that we've had you know four of these that are not good, three different renditions. Um, I think it's just kind of an odd coincidence. You know, Did you end up with Brian Cranston as Doctor Doom? Was that your final pick? Yes. I forgot it. Yes. Yeah, that's I watched I, I that want, video. I want him to be something. So you know, if he didn't get to be Lex Luthor, then let's get make him Doctor Doom. <laughs> uh, <laughs> sure, let's go for it. So um, it seems really easy to make a a good fun if if they can make Guardians of the Galaxy fantastic, Fantastic Force, pretty easy to make fantastic. I feel like they should. I saw this online. I feel like they should cast it where they they started out in the '60s and they went into a time warp or time some sort of. Uh, wormhole and then they come back now with still that 60s idealism i saw that online. Oh, that would i kind of i, I, I think I, I would like that a lot i i mean that's one of the things i i have really enjoyed about some of the which is because of captain america that there's just an old-fashioned vibe to some of it you have the cynical characters yeah. and then you have these just like good old-fashioned captain america thrown into the mix and he grows and he becomes more cynical as time goes along but you know just having that some of that in the mix i, I really enjoy that that would be amazing if they they did something like that would that. Be, that'd be cool because it'd be like well where were these guys this is marvel's first family well yeah they actually were marvel's first family they just got stuck in space right or to come maybe, back yeah finding some way to, you know to basically do captain america the first avenger you make that whole movie set in the 60s right. and then you make your big event uh, uh, you know, Avengers, blah blah blah, whatever the the return of it is, the new new mm-hmm. Avengers, and it's you know the X Men with the fan- and Fantastic Four travel through back through time, and you start going, oh man, that I'm just as excited as I was. Like, right. we're, we're, we're already, that excitement level is back. It's very easy to see how they could do that um, because they have X Men and Fantastic Four. Those are the the secret to all of this to make it like. All right, we lost Tony Stark. We lost Captain America. We just did the Infinity Saga. How do you keep up the excitement? X Men and Fantastic Four. Right. Well, and you still have the fact that you like Black Panther is really popular yeah. right now. Uh, Captain and we Marvel. Barely, did- like we had it, this massive, ev- important film, right. and then he's not really all that important in the the last two Avengers films. Exactly. He, yeah. he, we're in Wakanda. He's like he opened his doors. Right, <laughs> that's kind of it. <laughs> but that was it, and and he ran with the gauntlet for about twenty steps. Yeah, yeah, twenty steps. So like, <laughs> we want more of his story. Like, we want right. to see that. And so, yeah, that's it'll be interesting to see who they who they get for whatever this new Avengers is. Do they go with Ryan Coogler doing it? Um, Ooh. And you know, you think what what direction do they want to take that? Um, that's, that's where it gets, that's I think, I think, kind of fun and interesting. I feel like all these, like these phase four movies and even the directors of like Black, Black Panther, Captain Marvel, um, I feel like they're all kind of in the running. Like who would have thought the directors, you know, coming over, from, they're from community. Yep. The guys doing Winter Soldier would be like, these are the guys that are shepherding us to the, like to the, taking us home, getting us a touchdown. Right. Like I think everyone that's directing a Marvel film right now has an opportunity. If they show out in their movies, they could be the next person. Yeah. And that, I mean, that's, you just kind of step back and think about what, like that path that you just said of like, Captain America wasn't the, the popular franchise or character. No. Uh, even Winter Soldier, if you look at box office, it, it's not a particularly not the, successful film. And I think it's lower third of Marvel. Yeah, I am pretty sure it yeah. is. I, that, um, and so all of the phase one, almost all of phase one is is low box office because they were starting things off. But then right. after Avengers, you know, Iron Man 3 gets this huge bump. Captain America Winter Soldier made more money than first Avenger, but still it's not doing it's nearly not, as it, good as you would think it would, would do. Right. And like you said, these are guys coming from – Directing Community, Arrested Development, a bunch of forgotten comedies from 15 years ago. Mm-hmm. And they do Winter Soldier. And it's not the big one that made a ton of money, but it's one where they went, these guys know what they're doing. 
Yeah. You and then they're like, character. and then we're going to, we're going to give you a, uh, you know, your Avengers test with civil war. And they, however that worked out that they got civil war, like that, that you made a good winter soldier. Just do, and they did that movie. And then they went, hey, you pulled this off too. And now they're the guys that did end game. That's man. That like that going from directing community, which is not the most popular TV show out there. Um, to end game. Yeah. That's incredible. <laughs> it's, <laughs> that's, it's a hell of a journey, right? right in under them. 10 years of like, whoop. And yeah, that's Kevin Feige gives people a shot. And, you know, it, he seems to be very good at picking talent. Well, well, he does. And especially now that I think that, you know, that they cut ties with that Marvel creative team. That was a while ago. But, you know, like Feige is running it on his own. He's done a really good job of picking really interesting directors and kind of letting them do their own thing within the confines of Marvel. Mm -hmm. You know, with Taika Waititi, with Ryan Coogler, James Gunn to, you know, a certain extent as well. They've all been given like, here's the sandbox. Make sure you stay within the lines, but do whatever you want while you're in here. And that's where, you know, people criticize Marvel for being too formulaic. They all feel the same. And there's a side to that that's true. And there's a side to it that's, pretty stupid <laughs> like mm-hmm. you watch thor ragnarok that movie has a very distinct flavor to it yeah how are you going to say that's the same movie as any of the thors or like even uh captain america first avenger right. or something like that like this is not the same movie right i mean just even in the order of things you went um yeah what was sp- before that uh, spider man Spider-Man? Yeah. You, go, you go well this is the path guardians of the galaxy volume two yeah, to Spider Man, which is like you know high school John Hughes, John Hughes yep. comic book movie, Thor Ragnarok, and Thor Ragnarok, I mean, like you could make some comparisons to to Guardians, but they're wildly different. Yeah, that, it, that's that's being a little lazy. It, yeah, like some people are like, oh, they're doing Guardians of the Galaxy with uh, Thor, like uh, you know, even in the point that you're making about using '70s music. Uh, Led Zeppelin versus what Guardians or versus the type of music that James Gunn is using, like they're just totally different aesthetics. Like one is right. going for like the most popular band on the planet, Led Zeppelin, at you know the time, and the other is like very much picking his personal favorites. Right. Some of them are hits and some of them aren't. And so I mean, pretty different. And then that goes to Black Panther, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's a little different. Uh, that's a, that's a little different than Thor Ragnarok. To Infinity War, that's a little bit of a jump. To right. Ant Man and the Wasp, like those are they're so different. Those are all different movies, right? And like so, like all out comedy, very light hearted MacGuffin chase movie. Right after I, Infinity, I would War. say the origins. The origins can be a little yep, formulaic. That's true. That that would be, and that would be fair. And as and some of that, they, I think, even to the degree that they've made mistakes in some of that of like the first Ant Man, like there's a a guy that's trying to get technology that someone invented, but they won't give them access to, and so they make their own version of it that's just like okay, that's right. Iron, the first Iron Man movie, like that's right. that's too much. Even like Doctor Strange, although trippy visuals, yeah. They were trying to like squeeze that into like, okay, we got this formula. It's like the Iron Man, Ant Man uh, formula of this cocky guy finding redemption mm-hmm. and like learning the better way and then fighting the villain. It's like, uh, we're going to kind of squeeze this. We, we, they didn't go like full crazy on it, which I'm excited for hopefully in this next one is that they're going to go full out like, let's just get crazy with this thing. Right. So, and that, and me too. That's where, especially when they're like in the multiverse of madness, like, okay. Yeah. They're going cuckoo. And that ever since ever since that I mean, I really like the first Doctor Strange movie, but it's a good when, movie. when he's shown up in in Thor Ragnarok, the way he was used in Infinity War, I've just loved the character. Oh, I've loved so, I've loved him even yeah, ever I feel like the Russos and their Mick Marcus and McFeely, I think they do a really good job of taking characters and I think they're always written the best in their films. <laughs> You know, like Doctor Strange is like on another level now where I'm just like, yeah, yeah, I want to see that guy's movie right now. And and they I mean, like they also have the advantage, you know, since Civil War of having more toys in their toy chest. Mm-hmm. So it's a little bit more fun to see Doctor Strange interact with Tony Stark than it is to see him interact right. with random monk or Rachel McAdams, <laughs> the nurse. Like, right. 
That's true. They have that to their <laughs> so advantage. So they have that to their advantage, but the, the character has been like, they just like, I just loved those moments. And, you know, they, they're able to build off of so many things that I, I, I enjoyed about the, his film. Absolutely. Um, how are you doing on time? <laughs> We've yeah. almost gone two hours. Yeah, oh well, yeah. If we probably have a few more things, if you want to talk about, uh, sure, close things out a little bit. But yeah, I should probably close out at two hours since I got up. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll. Well, we'll... I, uh, so I, I rented the movie Long Shot from Redbox. I didn't see it in the theater. Okay. And then when I rented it, it told me that I could get a free game rental. So I rented the new Wolfenstein game for free. Okay. So right now we're at 10 o'clock. So once I get off this, I got to run downstairs, watch Long Shot, and then I need to stay up for like four more hours playing this free rental of Wolfenstein. So I've, I've got a busy night, very Jeez. busy night. <laughs> 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 the uh, important things in life. Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, let's, let's close with this. Okay. Um, we talked about, let, let, let's, yeah, let's like, we'll close with this. What is the movie you are most anticipating? In phase five, and I'll and I'll give you a couple different options. Okay. Assuming these all get made, Fantastic Four, X Men, Black Panther two, Captain Marvel two, Guardians three, and we'll throw in one more wild card, Spider Man three. For that batch right there, which one would I? I would go. Well, actually, we know Blade is in that batch too. Oh, I'm sorry, Blade is also. He did. In that he batch. did announce that. Uh, so yeah, and I don't think all of these will get made in Phase Five, but it's possible. They uh, they Phase sounds Three had like eleven possible. movies. Yeah, it, yeah. It, it sounds very possible. I would imagine if, uh, yeah. especially with Phase Four being short and not having right. a event film at the end of it, right? It seems very possible that Phase Five would be long, give you everything that you want, leading up to something whack insane, right? Um. Of of that batch right there, uh, I think X Men. X Men. Because what I saw, talked about before, uh, right? You know, even before we knew that they were going to get bought out and everything like that, I've been saying for about as long as I've had my channel, I want them to close out the X Men continuity, take four or five years off, and do a hard reboot for the reason that I said of like we're. We're like stretching out Wolverine, doing all these wacky stories with him, but we're not doing the Wolverine that we really want mm -hmm. him with the, in the X Men, and we're not, you know, all the like the classic like tee off, like this is your best bet to knock it out of the park. We're not doing any of that. We're we're repeating all these stories and doing wacky versions of it, and um, you know, it we're setting it in the seventies, then the eighties, then the nineties, and like the, this weird gimmick about the time jumps. Take five years off. And this franchise started the, this whole thing. It started the year 2000. Right. Um, like that is that's a long time ago. 19 years. And take time off. Rethink it and do a hard reboot of the whole thing. Just start over and do it. And it like it started before they cracked the code on how to do modern comic book movies. They were part of cracking that code. But just how much CGI has changed – how much the characters in the comics have changed. Right. All of that has happened. The general level of audience acceptance it's, for this. Yeah, all of this, like everything about it since when they did the classic version. And even they closed out that trilogy was 15 years ago almost. Right. In which case, that's what I wanted. And do a hard reset, do it proper inside of the uh, this universe you can use the snap as some explanation of maybe why mutant powers were triggered or some why we didn't know about where they were before. There's several things that you could do that could like make sense of it. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I, that's the one that I think I get to see one of these. If I could pick one, what would I want? I'd want that one. Then probably blade and then uh, probably guardians. Then fantastic Four, black Panther, <laughs> Captain Marvel. Hey, look at, look at you doing a ranking on the spot. Yeah. Uh, Spider Man would be probably be a little bit higher up. He'd probably be right in front of, yeah, probably be in front of Black Panther. Captain Marvel hey, two your, would probably be at the bottom. You're wasting content for your YouTube, man. This is all true. Your YouTube. That's true. I, uh, <laughs> I, I just so after they did the Comic Con announcement, I, I put out a video, kind of as an afterthought. Um, like I knew I wanted to do something about it, and I that weekend a new 
Marvel game came out for the Switch, and I told my kids when that came out, we would have like a whole video game weekend. It's that's what we did. Like we just sat there like twelve hours straight playing in the Switch. <laughs> oh, gosh, like never done that before. It's the first time we've ever had video game day, and it's like here, kids, eat all the candy you want. And like rot your teeth out. We're gonna brush our teeth every hour. Um, <laughs> And so then Comic-Con happened and that was a lot of fun too because I was just sitting there retweeting it, like watching it via Twitter and just retweeting as mm-hmm. they announced things. It was kind of a weird, very fun hour of my life. Mm-hmm. And so then two days later, I put out this video and didn't comparatively, didn't put that much time into it, 150,000 views. That is Jeez. crazy to me that that's what my life is. <laughs> it's like it's it's, it's 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 so weird to me because my day-to-day is not – in any way interesting because I, I stay at home most days because I work from home. Nobody recognizes me in real life. The the theater I go to as most common, the one by my house, I've never been recognized. No one's ever talked to me as a celebrity person there. Sure. Um, you know, I walk my kid to school, like nothing about it is, is, you know, anything like fancy or celebrity type stuff. But then, you know, in certain circles of the internet, people treat me like, even like, like you're surprised that like I responded back and like would do a podcast. It's right. Like, like, like uh, you know, what else am I yeah, going to do? I, I work for myself. Like, <laughs> right, right. Of course, I got the time. Why wouldn't I do right. it? Seemed nice enough. Right. So, um, so it's, it's, it's one of those ones that it's, it's, it's still just so wacky and surreal that, you know, threw my thoughts together real quick about phase four of the MCU and, uh, 150 people cared what I had to say about that. Right. <sighs> Mind blowing. 150,000. Yeah, 150,000. Give me the credit. Yes, that's a little, little difference. <laughs> yeah. Well, I appreciate you coming on, man. Um, you know, you're you're doing doing good things. You're doing big things, and and it's nice to see someone. You know, we've just talked for this two hours, but I, I can sense you're a good guy, and it's nice to see someone that's a good person doing good things and succeeding. So, I wish you all thank the you, best, man. You. And and uh, is there anything you want to plug before you get out of here? Yeah, uh, I mean, this podcast. Besides the like, obvious. <laughs> uh, obviously, my, check out my channel. If you right. want to talk movies with me, your best bet is to send me a direct message on Instagram. I really do read all of them and, and reply he to does. all of them. And like, it's very common that I will literally shoot a little video to someone. That's not like a rare thing. That's every single day I send videos to people. Sometimes I send, like, send a lot of videos to people. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I got a podcast starting off, so – if you like podcasts, yeah. which I imagine you since you're listening right now, I should have one in about six weeks. Don't have a title. Don't know what it will look like exactly. But, but six weeks from now, I will know. <laughs> Hopefully. That would be bad if I don't. <laughs> <laughs> perfect. Well, again, man, thanks for your time and uh, wish you all the best. Thanks for having me. Awesome. This is a Danger Entertainment podcast. DangerEntertainment.net. Danger Entertainment Podcast Network. Hey guys, this is Venice, and I've got a message from a friend of mine about my favorite podcast. It's your boy, Flavor, Flav, and Full Effect. Check this out, everybody. I want y'all to go check out TJ. What's good, everybody? TJ Johnson here from Voice from the Underground. I am the most handsome. Big ass. And I'm smoking my cigar, of course. You know what I'm saying? The Josh. You pick me up in an Uber and a PT Cruiser, I'm calling Lyft. Because <laughs> <laughs> they be fighting the power, talking about social issues, politics, you know what I'm saying? And we're not even that good. Right, we're terrible. <laughs> terrible. Tangents <laughs> all over the place. And not only that, but they be keeping the fun with the sports, music, comics, and movies too. Am I allowed to I talk? Think, I think, no, not right now. <laughs> Shut Did up, just... colonizer! <laughs> 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 you know what I'm saying? He on Twitter at VFU Podcast. So you can find him, you can find him. So check one, two. This is Flavor Flav. Yeah, boy. Okay. What Flav was trying to say is, check out Voice from the Underground on your favorite podcast network. Voice from the Underground.